<laughs> so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining, joining us for today's meeting of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee. I am Mignon Moore from the District of Columbia, and I, along with, with my co-chair, Jim Roosevelt, will be entertaining you today. I thought I'd open it up with a laugh. <laughs> Before we begin, please join me in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're joined on this occasion by DNC Chair Jamie Harris, Chair Harrison, led us through this historic midterm election, one which truly demonstrates the importance of investing in year-round organizing. His long-term commitment to the grassroots has paid off beyond our electoral victories. Through his leadership, we developed a party that reflects the diversity of the electric and welcomes every voice to take a seat at the table. Chairman Harris, would you like to offer a few words to the committee? Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and good morning, everybody. Now, if my normal Southern drawl may be a little more drawly than normal, uh, right before Thanksgiving, I got a wisdom tooth taken out, and then shortly thereafter, I got a dry socket. So um, uh, I've been hopped up on some medicines, so uh, if I'm a little loopy, <laughs> you know why. <laughs> But folks, let me, let me just say, I, first and foremost, let me thank Jim and Mignon. I wanna thank them for their warm welcome. I wanna thank them for their service to the DNC. We all owe a big debt of gratitude to these two amazing members of the DNC and our co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. <laughs> But that debt of gratitude is also extended to every member of this August committee. Uh, the Rules and Bylaws Committee is, does so much of the, the heart and hard work of the DNC. Uh, you know, rules is really the thing that, by which we are governed by. And so I wanna thank all of the members of this committee. I also wanna thank all of also our DNC staff, uh, folks who work end after end, day after day uh, to just make sure that you all have the information and the materials that are necessary. The staff led by Sam Cornell, who's my executive director, uh, Mary Beth Cahill, who is our senior advisor, Veronica Martinez Roman, who, who uh, is her, her portfolio is this committee. Um, uh, Nick and so many others, uh, I just wanna thank you all for the hard work and the efforts that you have made uh, to make this committee work and all of our committees work to do their work. So thank you all. <laughs> Folks, when, when I appointed the membership of this committee, I knew that we had some of the best minds in the Democratic Party, minds that are focused on being good stewards of this party, minds that are reflective of the values of the White House, but I'm truly blown away, my friends, by the level of commitment and the thoughtfulness by which you have taken this process. I know we're not at the finish line, but I also want to thank you all for conducting a process that our party can be proud of. You know, this has been a thorough, open, and transparent process. The committee has held nine public meetings, along with four public listening sessions and an online portal for public feedback. 20 states, 20 states applied to be in the early window, and in June, 16 states and Puerto Rico were chosen to present their case about why they should be moved to the early state window. So with that, I know we will have a spirited discussion today as we work to finalize our 2024 pre-window period. And again, I wanna recognize and thank all of our state parties for presenting us with such a difficult decision. 
However, my friends, the rules and by, uh, the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee proceeds as a committee. We have gained a much better understanding of the broad diversity of our democratic electorate, and I believe that this will make us better organizers, supporters, and leaders. As we move forward with an early window that reflects the diversity of our party, creates a more equitable and accessible nomination process, and puts our candidates in the best position to win, I look forward to working with all of you in continuing to grow and strengthen our party. As you all know me, and many of you have known me for many years, my guiding light is that this party, this is a party built on democracy. It's a party built on freedom. It's a party built on hope. And for many of us, for many years, in communities that I grew up in and communities that you all represent and live in, many people lost all sense of hope. But over these past few years, we've been fighting hard to bring that hope back. And we've done it because we have empathetic leadership in President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. People who have seen and experienced pain in their own lives and understands how hard and difficult it can be for many Americans. And they take those experiences to make sure that the American dream is alive and well for all of America's people. This committee continues in that tradition. So I wanna thank you all again for everything that you do and will do. I know that these things are not always easy. I know that they're tough, um, but I know that if anybody can get through it, this committee can. So thank you all again uh, for all you do and for all of your hard work. Madam Chair, Mr. Uh, Co-Chair, thank you again. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Harrison, uh, for your kind words, for Mignon and me, but for all of us here. Uh, and for your thoughtful remarks, which will carry us through these two days of crucial deliberations. The next item of business this morning is calling the roll, and for that I'm going to turn to our parliamentarian, Helen McFadden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Mr. Applebaum. I'm delighted to be here. Ms. Blanco. Presente. Ms. Brazil. I'm delighted to be here. Mr. Brennan. Present. Mr. Burgos has given his proxy to Mr. Spate. Ms. Cardona. Mr. Curry. I understand that Mr. Curry may have to leave, in which case his proxy goes to Mr. Applebaum. Ms. Daughtry. Ms. Dowdell. Present. Mr. Elite. Here. Ms. Fowler. Here. Mr. Iridia. Okay. Mr. Jones. Here. Ms. Kmark. Here. Mr. Leon. Ms. Lewis? Here. Ms. McGarrick? Mr. Martin? Ms. Martin? Here. Ms. Martinez has given her proxy to Ms. Blanco. Mr. McDonald? Here. Mr. McGinchy? Here. Mr. Mitchell? Here. Ms. Mount? has given her proxy to Mr. Jones. Mr. Ray. Here. Mr. Saunders has given his proxy to Ms. Weingarten. Mr. Spate. Here. Ms. Swecker. Here. Mr. Thompson has given his proxy to Mr. Alete. Ms. Weingarten. Here. Ms. Williams has given her proxy to Ms. Martin. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ms. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, since we do have a quorum, we'll just remind everybody that per our charter and bylaws, a quorum is constituted by 40% or 13 RBC members present in person or by proxy, and uh, we certainly have that. A big welcome, first of all, to our newest members, uh, Rachna Desai-Martin, where is there, there you are. And 
uh, Senator Chevron Jones. <laughs> Senator uh, Chevron Jones, there, there you are. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, Mignon and I would like to thank each of you for your service to the committee. You have committed an extraordinary amount of time to the Democratic Party, and we are so grateful to you for your contributions, as well as your patience and flexibility as we navigate this complicated process. Some of you in the call of the roll expressed how happy you were to be here, and I'll remind everybody that you are not under oath. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I also want to recognize the team who worked behind the scenes to make sure our meeting runs smoothly. In addition to Helen, we're grateful to the party affairs staff and interns, uh, Director uh, Veronica Martinez-Roman, Advisor Rick Boylan, Director of Operations Aaron Buechle, Special Assistant Jenna Whitaker, and Intern Katie Carita. We also owe a big thank you to the whole DNC team particularly including the Secretary's Office, uh, led by Director Jeannie Doherty, Nick Bauer and Austin Dieter, DNC Leadership Sam Cornell and Mary Beth Cahill, and our Counsel Graham Wilson and Andy Levine. Our sincere thanks to everyone for helping to make sure our meetings run smoothly and fairly. If you have any questions about the Rules and Bylaws Committee's work, please don't hesitate to contact our team. Mignon? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So as Chairman Harris said, over the past year, we have met nine times and held four public hearings regarding our work. This work has resulted in the 2024 call for the convention, which provides for the allocation of delegates and the rules of the convention and the 2024 delegate selection rules, which are the main rules governing how delegates for the convention are selected. Today and tomorrow, we will determine the 2024 regulations which codifies the committee's interpretations of the rules and the call. And we'll also see the model plan and checklist that the Party Affairs Department is preparing, along with other resources to provide to the state parties before the end of the year. But significantly, we will first discuss the 12A waivers and then this afternoon, we will introduce a chair's motion to determine the waivers to Rule 12A of the 2024 Delegate Selection Rules, which will provide in a report to be ratified by the DNC at its next meeting. So as you've heard, we have a lot of work to tackle over the next two days, beginning with the discussion of the early window. I want to begin by acknowledging the letter we received from the President and I'd like to read it into record for all of you. I find that this will be an honor and a privilege to read a letter from the President of the United States of America who has shaped this party and now he is shaping the values of our party. Dear Rules and Bylaws Committee, I'd like to commend you for the hard work you have put in over the course of the last two years. As I shared with the co-chairs Jim Roosevelt and Mignon Moore earlier this week, and as you gather to consider changes to the Democratic Party's nominating calendar, I want to be clear about the principles I believe we as a party should allow to guide our process. One, we must ensure voters of color have a voice in choosing our nominee much earlier in the process and throughout the entire early window. As I said in February 2020, you cannot be the Democratic nominee and win a general election unless you have overwhelming support from voters of color. And that includes black, brown, Asian American, Pacific, Pacific Islander voters. You should not be the Democratic nominee and win a general election unless you show working class Americans that you will fight for them and their families. For decades, black voters in particular have been the backbone of the Democratic Party, but have been pushed to the back of the early process, primary process. We rely on the vo these voters in elections, but have not recognized their importance in, nominating, in the nominating calendar. It is time to stop 
taking these voters for granted and time to give them a louder and earlier voice in the process. Too often, over the past 50 years, candidates have dropped out or had their candidates marginalized by the press and pundits because of poor performance in small states early in the, win in the process before voters of color cast a vote. As I said then, 99.9% .9 of black voters had not had the chance to vote at that point, and 99.8% of Latino voters had not had the opportunity. That is unacceptable in 2024, and it must change. Our party should no longer allow caucuses as part of our nominating process. We are a party dedicated to ensuring participation by all voters and for removing barriers to political participation. Caucuses requiring voters to choose in public to spend significant amounts of money, amounts of time to caucus, disadvantaging hourly workers and anyone who does not have the flexibility to go to, set, to a set location at a set time are inherently anti-participatory. It should be our party's goal to rid the nominating process of restrictive anti-worker caucuses. Our early states must reflect the overall diversity of our party and our nation, economically, geographically, demographically. This means more diverse states earlier in the process and more diversity in the overall mix of early states. Working class families are the backbone of our economy. Union households must be represented in greater numbers than before. We need to include voters from many backgrounds, not to ratify the choice of the er earliest states, but as full stakeholders in making this choice. There should continue to be strong representation from urban, suburban, and rural America, and from each region of the country, and states that prioritize making voting easier in both primary and general elections should represent their regions. The Rules and Bylaws Committee should review the calendar every four years to ensure that it continues to reflect the values and diversity of our party and our country. I got into this I got into politics because of civil rights and the possibility to change our imperfect union into something better. I have made no secret of my conviction that diversity is a critical element for the Democratic Party to win elections and to govern effectively. My commitment when I ran for president was that my administration would look like America, and it does. My administration has the most diverse cabinet in history and the most diverse group of presidential appointees in history. My nominee to the Supreme Court was the first black woman and most qualified candidate to ever be nominated. Just like my administration, the Democratic Party has worked hard to reflect the diversity of America by, by our nominating process, it does, but our nominating process does not. For 50 years, the first month of our presidential nominating process has been a treasured part of the democratic process, but it is time to update the process for the 21st century. I am committed to working with the DNC to get this done. Sincerely, Joe Biden. And I would add President Joe Biden. The proposed early window package of South Carolina on February 6, Nevada and New Hampshire on February 13th, Georgia on February 20th, and Michigan on February 27th is based on the testimony of the committee, the applications of the states, and the principles within the resolution we passed earlier this year. We feel strongly that this window that reflects our values, paints a vibrant picture of our nation, and creates a strong process that will result in the best Democratic nominee. And, as you all know, to have a system that works and provides stability for future presidential campaigns, the window cannot be decided piecemeal. 
The logistics of this window will be something we need to navigate as a committee, but I agree with the president that this is a bold window that reflects the values of our party, and it is a window worth fighting for. As we begin this discussion, I'd also like to start by thanking state parties for the time and effort they poured into their applications. During this process, it was truly remarkable to hear just how diverse our party is. I know we have all found this information, found the information we've learned over this cycle to be informative and inspiring. Our state parties have not left us with an easy decision, and we are looking forward to engaging in this conversation today. As a reminder, 12A states, no meetings, caucuses, conventions, or primaries, which constitute the first determining stage in the presidential nomination, the date of the primary and primary states, and the date of the first tier caucus and caucus states may be held prior to the first Tuesday in March or after the second Tuesday in June in the calendar year of the national convention. Provided, however, that the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee may provide waivers to state parties to hold their first determining stage before the window within the calendar year. I know that's a mouthful, but we have Jim here. He'll explain it all. <laughs> all waivers of this rule as approved by the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee are subject to the ratification by the DNC. This afternoon, we will offer a chair's motion of the states permitted to host the first determining step of the nominating contest outside the window defined currently by 12A. But first, do any members have thoughts on the early window or the proposed package that they'd like to share? We, we will not vote on the waivers until after lunch, just for the record. I'd like to remind everybody when you uh, are called on, if you look at your speaker, it tells you where to push to talk. Uh, and please identify yourself because given the shape of the room, the uh, audience won't know who you are unless you say so. Mr. Apple. Uh, uh, Mr. Applebaum. Yes. Thank you. I'm Stuart Applebaum. I'm a DNC member from New York. The process we've used has been deliberative and thoughtful, and I've learned a great deal about our party and our nation during this process. I believe that the proposal before us is an elegant proposal. Early on, as we were beginning our deliberations, Randy Weingarten, I believe, pointed out to us that what we needed to do is not just to choose states, and the order in which they go, but to tell the story of who we are as a party and who we are as a nation. And I think as the president has highlighted so eloquently, our early states must reflect the overall diversity of our party and our nation, economically, geographically, demographically. And he also points out working class families are the backbone of our economy. I think that the story we are telling with these selections is a story we can be proud of as the Democratic Party of the United States. This is what our party looks like. This is what America looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Applebaum. I think Ray has his hand. Is that Ray? Mm -hmm. Good morning, Ray Curry, a DNC member from Michigan. During this process, clearly there was an effort to take a look at what was taking place around the country out from a historical perspective and also from a current day perspective. And during this process, I think that we had a chance to have a lot of conversation, a lot of different debate about this. And you know, it's, it's probably allowed a greater understanding of where the country's played out, even uh, with the most recent election cycle from November. 
During this time, we also aim to increase diversity in an early window, and clearly discussions around Michigan actually get that. We also aimed at adding more diverse populations in the country, and when you looked at where the electoral was and what was happening, Michigan actually gets that again. We've added 1.3 million African Americans to the population, and that gets to that gets to meet the great needs of many candidates and is also a game changer uh, during this process. Detroit's also seen a significant increase in the Latino population with a large concentration in southeastern part of the city. And we have the strongest presence of Arab Americans in Detroit metro suburbs. Another key piece when we talk about the reflective diversity of this nation. This dramatically changes also is the role of labor. Michigan is the home to more than 500,000 union members, and I am proud to be one of those members representing the United Auto Workers. That's more union members than we had in the early window previously, and it's a game changer for working Americans. Maybe most importantly for the state of Michigan has been the winning coalition for every Democratic president elected over the last century. That's why we're here to win elections, and that's why we need Michigan to be part of that. And one of the most successful things that I'm proud of in November, we accomplished in Michigan, was a key piece of being able to take the House and the Senate back. Very important role to have had the Council of State elected with a governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and a secretary of state. Those are key pieces that we saw. Those are key pieces that reflect the diversity of Michigan and the diversity of the nation that we seek in this early window. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Luis, can you state your name and where you're from? Yes. Uh, Luis Arelia, Arizona. I, I want to point to a, a statement that was made yesterday and the um, rule at least that this body has the authority to supersede state statute. So I asked if, if there could be clarity uh, from our attorneys or Graham, I, I think I asked for that. I, I, I'm, pr I'm, I'm putting this out forward because at any point in this discussion, when state laws are gonna be mentioned as either tradition or history, I, I wanna point a, put a point of order in the conversation because there is the ability for this body to make these decisions. And what the president has presented is a moment that we're meeting history. And, and I want to support meeting that moment in the best possible. We are commissioned to do so for the future of our party. We are the creators of our own destiny, and we have challenged the rules of our party to allow other people like myself to be seated in this body. Uh, and that has been because of a long struggle, a lot of facing history in ways that we need to continue to face history. but. What we are facing is a uh, ability for this body to make those decisions, regardless of what a state party will send out in a press release or will say a comment. I want to make it very clear, and when members of this body continue to advocate that there is a state statute or a precedent or a historic or a tradition, that has no meaning in this body, because we get to make those rules to nominate the president of this country. So uh, the question is, I mean, I know you sent the... I, I got a copy of the uh, 2000 decision, uh, Graham or Rick? Yes, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, while the party doesn't have the ability to dictate to a state what its law is, the party doesn't have the ability to uh, mandate um, a change to state law, the party has the ability to dictate the process by which we select our nominee the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized political uh, parties' rights under the First Amendment um, to select the manner of choosing our own nominees and has, in fact, repeatedly invalidated state laws that limit or infringe on a party's ability to dictate how they select their nominees. Thank you. Uh, Randy? Thank you. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, you know, as... Randy, would you like to state your name? I'm Randy? sorry. Randy Weingarten, um, <laughs> New York. So I want to... Um, 
I support what um, the President of the United States um, has asked us to do. Um, but I want to I want to um, um, talk about it um, from this respect. Like Stuart, you know, I'm from a state that was not in competition for being one of the early states. Um, but I am friends with and colleagues with a lot of people around this table who were, and we engaged and campaigned in those states in the last, you know, three months and have, you know, done a lot of work. And I want to just say to the states around the table, particularly those who have been representative of states that were in this competition, that people did a damn good job in representing their states, in representing um, what putting their states in front, talking about not only their state's needs, but how it fit in terms of who we are as Americans and who we are in terms of our values, the party. And I think that um, part of the process over the next two days is to honor that work of those states in particular, and also to honor the work of the chairs. And Stuart said this, but I, I, you know, I've been around the party for a long time now. I think the process that the chairs put together, and I'm glad that the DNC chair is here to hear this, the process that the chairs put together um, was able to tee up a really innovative, interesting, eloquent, bold um, recommendation by the President of the United States. Because everyone had their voice heard and everyone had a stake in this and everyone started seeing what would emerge because of the process that the chairs put together. And I just wanted to say those two things up front and express some gratitude about that. Um, I did say, as Stuart said earlier, that our process in terms of the Rules and Bylaws Committee is we, we make a recommendation about what is going to be in the best interests of we the people in America. Because we believe that whoever we nominate ultimately as for President of the United States of America is in the best interest of we the people in America. And so part of that is the representation and the diversity, and part of that is also the story of progress, the story of struggle, and the story of progress. And I think what the President has done here in this letter is to tell us what that story of progress is in this country. By, by, by showing, particularly in a period of time in this country, where we are going through um, a fight for freedom and a fight for democracy and a, and, a, and a fight for representation and a fight for being seen. To say that a state like South Carolina should go first, it sends a message about representation. But what it also does by saying that Nevada and, 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 and New Hampshire should go together, it sends another important message about representation, that representation matters everywhere. And by talking about Georgia and, and Michigan, it sends a message about these states who gave a damn good, as did others, but states who gave a damn good presentation about what they represent in the country. So I'm just, I'm saying from the perspective of someone who is watching from the outside and doesn't have to go back to a state and defend and sell this, that this is an <laughs> eloquent way of showing progress of who we are as Democrats and what this nomination process means. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Frank? Thank you, uh, Frank Leone, District of Columbia. I, I do support this uh, bold and, and creative approach. I, I have a question. 
Um, as Grant said, we as a committee in the DNC can't dictate state law. What we're doing, what we're going to be doing is granting waivers uh, for, that states can take advantage of, but some states may need to um, act in terms of having their Secretary of State fix a date or make legislative changes. Is there a deadline by which those states need to act in order for the waivers to be effective? Yes. Yes, there is. And we're going to have a little bit more discussion about this after lunch, but yes, there is. Joanne, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with a lot Can you of say Joanne, name and Joanne where Dowdell, you're from? New Hampshire. I'm okay, sorry. Thank you. I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made um, thus far with regards to the process that this committee has engaged in around a very challenging issue. Um, we have been very deliberative. It has been open, it has been transparent, and I feel that we have really given our time and attention to what it means. I feel that the President of the United States has made a very bold statement about his vision for this country, the importance of diversity. I don't think there is a person in this room that would argue with, with any of that. I will, however, say that New Hampshire does have a statute. We do have a law. And we will not be breaking our law, and I feel that any lawyer in the room or around the table um, would agree that it is not in the best interest of this body to even suggest that we do that. Um, so that is really the position of New Hampshire. We will not be breaking our law. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donna? Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Donna Brazil, and I uh, am here in the capacity of my residency in the District of Columbia, uh, but I hail from the great Bayou State of Louisiana. And I pray that LSU get some slot in one of the college bowls. <laughs> uh, Frank Sonnenberg, who is a, a great author, I call him a lot because he's always optimistic. He says that tradition represents a critical piece of our culture. They remind us that we are part of a history that defines our past, shape, shapes who we are today, and who we are likely to become. Tradition reinforces values such as freedom, faith, integrity, because tradition offers an excellent context for, for meaningful pause and reflection. So perhaps I'll add my own words and say that we hold on to tra traditions because they give us a sense of security sometimes. Sometimes we hold on to traditions because they give us a foundation from which we grow. But as many of us know on this committee, we also believe that traditions can be passed down and transferred, especially when you're opening up new doors and you're helping to expand the electorate so that every American can enjoy full citizenship. I applaud President Biden's commitment not only to diversity, but for embracing the values of who we are as Americans. It's been a long time to wait to see a president that can see all of us, each and every one of us, as human beings capable of embodying the American dream. Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And as a member of the Price Herman Commission, some of my colleagues are still on this body. Yes, let me just go on and make a, I've been on this committee for a while, y'all. 
and I'm proud of the work of this committee. But the price Herman Commission made a powerful recommendation at the time of adding South Carolina and Nevada to the early window because we wanted to ensure more voices would be heard when we choose our candidates. More voices, people who live on dirt roads. Do you know what it's like to live on a dirt road? Do you know what it's like to try to find running water that is clean? Do you know what it's like to wait and see if the storm's going to pass you by and your roof is still intact? That's what this is about. It is about seeing other people in the United States of America, hearing those voices. Let them tell you how they make ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck. Let us hear from them. Let us ride in their carriages. I know she had one last night. She went to the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine. Hell, I wish it opens up on me. Somebody might ask me for the next one. <laughs> Jamie put me on the list. <laughs> But I'm so proud that we're going to hear from more voices, voices of those who simply yearn to be heard, to be seen. When I was born, this party did not see me, folks. It did not see me. But, but with the courage of Fannie Lou Hamer. See, I can talk about this because I lived this party with the tenacity of John Lewis and those who marched and bled with Septima Clark and Joe Lauer and, yes, Jesse Jackson. I've lived this party. I've been out in New Hampshire. God, I got winter clothes because of those experiences. <laughs> and I'll go again. And I'll go again. But I'm so glad when we added South Carolina and Nevada that we got a chance to elect Barack Obama. That was the first candidate to go through that experience. And we nominated Hillary Clinton, 80,000 votes sharp, but we did that too. And yes, we got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yes, we have done some awesome things. And God knows if I had more time, I'll tell you what Newt Gingrich says about Joe Biden, but that would take me beyond the scope of the conversation. <laughs> but he said Biden is winning. He said Biden is winning. He said Biden is winning. I'm not going to abandon a president who is winning for the American people. I'm not going to abandon a president who said, let's go on the dirt road. I'm not going to abandon a president who said, let's see what we don't see and believe what we can't even dream of. That's who Joe Biden is. So, folks, I want to say to all of you who applied, I was right now on the states, Scott, oh, Joanne, Ken, you know, I'm talking about Iowa, New Hampshire, Minnesota, Yvette, Maryland. My Delaware friend. I mean, we got so many people on this committee. Mignon, you got to go back home to Illinois, and, yo, and you ain't bringing shit back either. <laughs> I'm standing with the committee and the president. <laughs> but I want to say to all of you who applied, because I know this is going to be my last rules and bylaws committee to determine a calendar. Hell, I did, what, 2000, 2004, 8, 12, 16? 20? I think 24 is enough for me. I'll give you that. But I'm going to tell you something in shaping this calendar. This one is going to speak to me. It's going to speak to children where I was born. It's going to speak to people who sometimes don't get to be seen as truly good, honest, hardworking, taxpaying Americans. It's going to speak to that young immigrant who is now an American citizen and says, yes, I matter. It's going to speak to my labor brothers and sisters. It's going to speak to all of us because we know that our role in this party and our role as Democrats and as Americans is to open doors and to allow, as I think the prophet Amos said, you see, I miss Leah because I'm going to have to quote the Bible and she's not here to correct me. <laughs> the prophet Amos said, let, let water run down the river and righteousness as, as its mighty stream. We are creating a ripple effect. So be set with this, folks. It won't hurt us. It's only going to help make the American story 
real for all Americans. So I urge us to support the president's proposal. Thank you. I give back the balance of my time. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid the balance of your time has to go to Elaine, and I don't know how you followed that, Elaine. So you might want to just tell us how you enjoyed the state dinner last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's very hard to follow Donna all the time, but I've been following my dear friend for decades now, so I'm just used to it. <laughs> Here's what I like about this proposal. Um, you know, you start in politics from your base. You start from your most loyal base. If your base isn't with you, forget about it, right? But then you have to grow. Mm -hmm. And so I like South Carolina first. And then if you notice after South Carolina, the other four states, every single one is a swing state. Mm -hmm. Every single one is a state that we need to win, but it is not by any means automatically in our column. So in Nevada, I've learned already to say Nevada, not Nevada. Um, <laughs> in Nevada, you know, as good a year as we had, we saved a United States senator, but we lost a governor, okay? So they're tight states. And so our candidates, when we run them through this gauntlet, they have to show us first and foremost mm -hmm. that they get our loyal base. But then they've got to show us that they can move to a Hispanic base, which is um, not quite as loyal, but still very big, still very important to Democrats. They've got to show us that they can win those suburbs in Georgia that are so vibrant and growing and that contain a lot of college-educated white women who are often with us, but sometimes not. We can't keep, take them for granted. We need to show that we can win those college-educated techies in New Hampshire and that, that we can keep them with us. We need to show that when we get to Michigan, we can win not just the African-Americans in Detroit, but that we can win Macomb County. Mm -hmm. Macomb County, it has been, since the Reagan era, the epitome of the weakness of the Democratic Party, which is our union white working class vote. We've got to show that we can win back Macomb County. And I, that's why I think the president's proposal, which will be our proposal, I dearly hope, <coughs> is so on point. You start with your base, but then you move to where you ask the question, can our candidates win in these diverse swing states? And you got to move all the way from the base to a majority. And I think, frankly, we're on our way to doing that. I think these last elections in Nevada and Arizona and Georgia showed that, hey, things are going in our, things are moving in our direction. And this, ref, this plan for 2024 reflects that. Now, we may not, it may be a big, you know, nothing burger in 2024 if our president runs again and we don't have a contest, okay? That, I, so be it, right? But this is a good template for the future. And the Republicans don't have this kind of template. So I think we've done, we'll do well by adopting this, and I hope we will. Thank you. Yvette? Thank you, and thank you for not making me follow Donna. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to speak as a state that was Would not like chosen. To, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Yvette Lewis, yeah. chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. And I want to speak as a state that was not chosen, um, a state that put forth uh, uh, a presentation, um, a state that I am extremely proud of. Um, I will say that we're disappointed, as I think a number of states that didn't make it are uh, disappointed. But. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to congratulate the states that did win, but I also want to say to the President of the United States that Maryland has your back. We are 100% on board in supporting what the President of the United States wants. But even though we were not chosen, I don't think it lessens or diminishes the state of Maryland in any way, especially after the historic election that we just had. And for those of you that have not heard me say it, <laughs> We do have an African-American governor, Westmore, and we do have an AAPI lieutenant governor, Aruna Miller. 
And one thing that I know uh, about our state, as all of you should know, whether you made it through or not, uh, we are confident in our position as a leader on the national stage, every single one of us. The fact that we even put ourselves out there means that we should feel confident of our position on the national stage in terms of what we did. Our progress and our success here, um, especially in Maryland, is gaining us the recognition that we deserve. We are truly the little engine that could, and we will continue to be the little engine that could, and we will do even more, especially with this outstanding leadership that we have in the state of Maryland. Um, I think that we've embraced our party's diversity uh, in a way that not only talks the talk, we walk the walk. And we have demonstrated that. We have uh, a governor and a lieutenant governor that made us believe, that made us not be afraid of diversity, that made us believe that we could campaign and work in every single part of the state, our diverse parts of the state, but also in our rural areas where we had white working class people and still find a way to win. So I often say Maryland is America in miniature and as goes Maryland, <laughs> so goes the nation. So I encourage all of us to embrace this, this ticket, the way that the president has outlined this and let's move this forward because it is truly historic and it is a change. And I can tell you from personal experience, making history feels real good. It feels real good. And I think we all should try to do that as we move forward with this selection. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Jack. Uh, David, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mignon. David McDonald, Washington State. I want to, um, like Donna, I've served on this committee many cycles. It is not unusual for us to get a communication or a recommendation from a president or a nominee. Um, but I think it's worth commenting on the extraordinary nature of this particular communication. Um, a thoughtful letter, um, a letter that reflects, um, I think, not just the president's personal views, but his consideration of the comments that we have made in the various um, hearings that the presentations were made. It, it kind of goes beyond his personal preference. And I was not, I want to re repeat here something I said last night. I was very impressed with um, when the co-chairs advised us that the president had, had not just read the submissions from the parties, but had read the transcripts of the um, RBC discussions. Um, and I think the comments that he made back reflect that. Um, it's an extraordinary level of engagement about the future of the party from our nominees. Um, it, it's, it, it, it's hard to state for somebody who has not sat here um, as long as some of us have, how unusual it is to have that level of thoughtful explanation and consideration of what we have said um, by the White House. He is, in many respects, a surprising um, and extraordinary president. I'm not the first person to note it, but, and I'm sure I won't be the last. Um, second, um, The other thing that's extraordinary about this letter is coming from um, the West, not living out here, um, it's not uncommon um, to have the reaction that things feel different on the street than they do inside the Beltway. Um, he has captured the fact that the country has changed because he's been out in the country, I think, faster than we sometimes captured it inside the Beltway. Um, and I think he has also captured the fact that it's not going to stop changing. This is not a, a moment in time. This is not a, a solution to a problem that we can now put on the shelf. It's going to continue. And I thought it was significant that his letter included a very express recommendation that we consider the calendar again in 2028, not in a pro forma fashion, not with a sense that everything had been locked up. We don't need to think about this again, but to give it's some consideration as to whether the changes that we are making this cycle um, have side effects that we don't like um, or um, point to ways that we could do things uh, better, but not just to simply put it um, on the shelf. And uh, I intend to support um, the recommendation, although I have a concern about having New Hampshire and 
Nevada on the same day, um, on opposite sides of the country. Um, I think we ought to have some kind of flexibility in the calendar to make those separate um, days. I, I think it's a confusing message to have them on the same day, frankly, and it may dilute um, the importance of each of the states because they will be in a constant comparison with the other side and getting divided press. But I'm not saying I won't vote for it. I'm just saying I have reservations about it. And then finally, um, I want to make some comments about the next time we look at this just to preserve them for the record. I think one of the things that we will need to look at is whether the introduction of large states into the front window effectively creates a bias towards certain kinds of candidates. Um, we've generally had an open process because we kept small states that were relatively inexpensive to campaign in up front, and we are making a shift. It's a, a gradual shift. We're kind of creating a, a transition stepping stone between the early small states and the um, Super Tuesday type events as we get gradually in size, but it's pretty significant. I mean, one of the articles I think this morning noted that the first three states have 114 delegates and then Georgia has 105 and um, uh, Michigan has 125. I mean, it's a real fast scale up. So I think we need to think about whether there are ways to mitigate that. Um, second, um, I don't know if this is true of everybody in the committee, but for the last several cycles, my election has not been over until I've seen what happened in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Nevada. The election didn't end at 11 o'clock East Coast time. And I, I, it's hard to not comment on the fact that the West for the last four cycles has has contributed at least 35% of the electoral votes necessary to win the presidency. And in 2020, contributed 40% of the electoral votes necessary to win the presidency. And it could contribute more if we paid more attention to it. And I, th I think when we consider the calendar next time, that we should, in fact, be reaching out to some more of the Western states, not, not necessarily the Pacific, but I think of as the Pacific Wall. You know, there's a a blue wall in the Midwest, and there's a Pacific wall along the coast. But the interior of the West, where there's a lot of opportunity for growth, and I don't think it's coincidental that we have seen a, a big jump from contributing, say, 25% of the electoral votes necessary up to 35% after we added Nevada into the cycle in 2008 <coughs> and began to get early consideration of some of those issues. So I, I hope that we will... Uh, keep that in mind for the next cycle. And with that, I, as Donna would say, I yield, I yield the negative deficit of time because I've gone <laughs> over like to whoever has time left. You yield it to the gentleman to your left, Mother. <laughs> <clears throat> um, thank you, <clears throat> Mo Alethi from DC. Um, it's a pretty cool moment for a first timer on this committee to be part of something this historic. Um, we said in the beginning, we wanted to tell a story, right? And Randy referenced this early. From our very, very first meeting, we said we wanted to be able, when we look at the window, the early window in its totality, to be able to tell a story. And that the story we wanted to tell was that we valued diversity, we valued inclusivity and getting more voices into the process and that we wanted to speak to battleground state voters to make an, a case to them earlier and I think this does it I think um, before I say a couple of make a couple of specific points I also want to applaud the process I want to applaud the openness of this process I want to applaud the thoroughness of this process. I want to applaud every state that came in and made a presentation. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege, and specifically, I want to thank Scott and the state of Iowa for the historic role it has played in this process, in our in our political history. 
it's remarkable, has helped produce some amazing nominees and presidents. But we have said at the beginning of this process that as a party we are changing, as a, we have different needs, we have different, as our priorities evolve, as our electorate evolves, that we needed a process that evolved. And I think this is a process that allowed us to do that. Um, and I think this result reflects that. We are bringing more voices into the process earlier, and we're making ourselves more competitive in a general election. And that's what the DNC is supposed to do, make us competitive in a general election. I think um, the fact that we are, I think there's some things we may want to, you know, we're going to have to work out some logistics. We're going to have to work out some details. But I like the message we are sending to voters about, we're not, what I like about this is we are, we are saying every voice matters. <coughs> every region matters. Every voice matters. Every community matters. The fact that we are saying, I, I actually like, I think it's going to be a logistical pain to some extent, David, but I actually like Nevada and New Hampshire on the same day and the message that it sends that we value all communities and all voters. I want to um, also say one of the things I liked about the process we just went through um, is because it was so open, because it was such an inclusive process, because we allowed um, so many people to make their case, um, that I feel good that we will be able to mitigate any challenges. I think back to something Elaine said, though, I guess it must have been in our August meeting, about how some of the decisions we made in that meeting were among the most historic decisions this committee has ever made. In the way we empowered the DNC to enforce the decisions we're going to make today. And I think that is important, is that we now have a process in which everyone has bought in, everyone made their best case, everyone got a fair hearing, we are making a decision that I think people can get behind and we've also empowered the chairman to enforce this decision in a way that gives it more teeth than I think it ever has before, which I think will be important in the event that um, there are any issues. But I hope that there aren't. I so appreciate the fact that almost every state has been willing to work within the parameters that we've been talking about and has been willing to say that they will do what they need to do back home in order to make the process work. I hope that continues to be the case. I hope that a combination of the message that we sent and the enforcement mechanism we are putting into place will, um, will give us the strongest possible schedule that articulates our values and that makes us competitive in a lot more states than we ever have been coming out of the early window. So, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Chevron. Thank you so much, um, Madam Co-Chair. And my name is Chevron Jones from Florida. I know we weren't considered on that list, uh, but, and not even a but. I want to change the dynamic of the conversation as a millennial um, and probably the youngest member sitting at this table at 39 years old and having the chance to sit at a table with individuals who I've read about, a process that I've read about, and to even get a letter from the president in email yesterday actually helping us because I prayed for help in Uber. Because I knew for a fact, even in the orientation, um, that this was a big committee to sit on, 
But I also was confident in the people who sit at the table, who sit at this table, in the same reasons um, I just made mention of in the beginning. So I want to speak to the, our next generation of the story that Stuart started speaking of, that Randy made mention of, that Donna made mention of, and it's been the consistency across this board and who we leave this party in the hands of. And that's my generation. And what precedent that we set to ensure that the story that we're telling that it continues. It also boggles me to speak to those individuals who might walk out of this room uneasy with the change that may happen. And I want to echo after Ms. Lewis, who made it clear that this doesn't preclude those other states from being able to go and put all hands on deck. I actually, I think it enhances us to ensure that we use these other states as models in states like Florida and other states that are just not there yet, but we're working our way to get there. I believe change is good. I believe change is necessary, as all of you have made mention of. Change sometimes can cause tension, but it does not have to cause a tear. And I think that as a party, thanks to Chairman Harrison, thanks to the president, we see the change that is happening, and I believe that this process does speak to what the president spoke of when he first came and said that this is what he is going to do and run for president of the United States, even when I campaigned in Iowa. Not realizing that was my first time caucusing for someone. It was cold as hell in Iowa. <laughs> but the appreciation that I had for that process, but then to look at this process now and I'll, to see everyone's comments, it does not exclude Iowa from this conversation or any other state who might be concerned about this process. If we're truly trying to create that story, I believe that this creates the story and I believe that the conclusion of that story all ends in us uniting, walking out of this door that when the media sees this, they know that although all not happy, all is well. And I'm happy to support the president in this. I'm happy to support the chair in this. And again, I'm just happy to be able to sit at a table with individuals who have been in this process and looking forward to how we continue to include individuals who come from my generation so we can continue telling the story of what America is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chevron. So do we have any more comments, questions? Uh, is that Maui? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And I want to echo my thanks to the co-chairs and really everyone on, oh, sorry, Molly McGarrick from Delaware. I um, want to thank everyone for this wonderful process. And I just want to say as an American, but also as a Delawarean, I'm so proud of our president and we are happy to share him with the country. Uh, this is, this letter is who he is, his commitment to Justice, his thoughtfulness, his commitment to progress is the Joe Biden that we've known and have been privileged to have serve our state. And again, just so honored to support, continue to support him, to support this proposal, and really to support our party and our country going forward. Thank you. Artie, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair, Artie Blanco, Nevada. Today is an important day. The day that Nevada's favorite son, born in Searchlight, Nevada, we are discussing what is the final piece of legacy the late Senator Harry Reid worked for in his final year of life and how he placed this first generation brown girl nearly over nine years ago to represent the battle-born state who grew up in a home of a single father who lost his right hand on the job where the machine failed him, but his union contract did not let him fail me or my younger brother. He taught me the importance of a work ethic that I continue to carry today. 
Since the age of 18, I have been working my entire career in electing not only Democrats, but pro-labor Democrats across the country. Nevada is my home now, and I'm a proud Team Reed member. Nevada is a diverse state with 29% Latino, 10% Black, a growing and continuing to grow Asian Pacific Islander population of 9.5, Native American, 2%, mixed races, 5%, and 48% white Americans. Las Vegas is a union town, and I'm a proud second generation union member and Democrat, while also a first generation Mexican American who while in high school, I had to wash plastic dishes in a bucket con la manguera, that's a water hose in Spanish, because it took a year for my dad and uncles to rebuild the modest home he purchased with settlement dollars he received from the right hand the machines took from him. Nevada's voting laws create equitability and accessibility to the ballot. From automatic mail ballot voting, early voting, same day voter registration, and election day voting centers. Re-electing the only Latina that secured the 50th state for a Democratic Senate. Re-electing our three Democratic members of Congress, including Stephen Horsford, who was elected chair of the CBC by his 58 colleagues just yesterday. Re-electing our Attorney General, who is Nevada's only statewide elected African American. Re-electing our Treasurer, who is a labor champion working to continue to grow our union membership by investing in building affordable housing with Nevada union labor. Taking back and electing the Secretary of State position with a young Latino of the West. We increase democratic control of both chambers and the legislatures with strong leaders elected. Nevada plays by the rules and works hard to secure. We worked hard to secure national support from a number of organizations and leaders recently. Let me just read a list of the most recent. The Congressional Black Caucus, CBC PAC. Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Bold PAC. Congressional AAPI Caucus, Aspire PAC. Senator Alex Padilla, Senator Ben Ray Lujan, CA PAC Chair Congresswoman Judy Chu, Latino Victory Fund, Voto Latino, Somos Votantes, Mi Familia Vota, Nuestro PAC, Poder PAC, Asian American Action Fund, AAPI Victory Alliance, Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote, APIA Vote and indigen the Indigenous Peoples Initiative. However, as a good steward member of this committee, I request a slight adjustment be considered to the recommendation presented to us this morning. My request is that South Carolina, as tradition, continues to hold its contest on Saturday, February 3rd, and Nevada be allowed to remain on their current presidential primary date, the first Tuesday in Feb February, which for 2024 is February 6th. I believe that this request allows for the committee to be in line with the wishes of our great president, Joe Biden. However, Nevada will not be able to adjust their date by an unknown deadline, which we hope to hear later. Historically, South Carolina has held their contest only on Saturdays from January 26th in 2008, February 16th in 2016, and February 29th, 2020. This request is great politics for a great battleground that has proven ourselves and outworked any pundits that had the audacity to say that, Latino, that the Latina senator was not winning with Latino voters. If we want to build a stronger relationship with Latinos, or as someone said, build their loyalty to the Democratic Party, then Nevada must stand alone on a date and not have to share that date that is necessary for 
us to accomplish those goals. I'm a proud President Biden voter, believer. We share in the same faith that I still carry every time I lecture at my Catholic church. And I love him for his letter and his beautiful words. So this is in no way in that disrespect, but I ask the committee to consider this change to the recommendation. Thank you, Artie. Thank you. I, you know, my, my plan, because I am not as eloquent a speaker as some of the people who have gone before me, was to wait until the end of all of this and just say thank you. Uh, Carol, would you like to say where you're from? I, I'm sorry? Would you like to say where you're from? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Carol Fowler from South Carolina. Uh, the, I, I'm pleased that so many of us are pleased with the process and with the president's recommendation. Certainly, Democrats in South Carolina are pleased with this. I am thankful for the process that we have gone through. I am a little sad for so many of my disappointed friends, both on this committee and in state parties around the country. Um, I am, I have, I've only speaking because I want to say in response to what uh, Ms. Blanco said about moving South Carolina's date. Um, if that becomes a motion and becomes a cons an actual something that this committee is um, considering, I will have a lot more to say about it. And I want to say South Carolina does not mind voting on a Saturday. We actually think that works well for us. But um, there are some other things I want to say before this committee gets to thinking of actually passing a motion to, to change the dates that the president has recommended. But un, until then, I will just say thanks to all of you who have taken part in this process and who, uh, who cycle after cycle make this work for the good of Democrats and our presidential candidates. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. So this is the last call before we break for lunch. Do okay, Scott. <laughs> That's great, Scott. Scott Brennan, Iowa. I've got things to say. Oh yes. <laughs> yes, Scott. Um, thank you, co-chairs, and thank you, Chair Harrison, um, and, and truly thank you, all of my friends, and we have spent an inordinate amount of time together over the last year, and, and I do consider you my friends. Um, and I do want to begin by acknowledging the leadership of Iowa's Democratic Chair, Ross Wilburn, who is here with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While I support the guiding principles established by this committee and reinforced by the President, I cannot support the proposal before us. We are now faced with a situation in which no state situated in the central or mountain time zone is represented in the, the pre-window, and three of the five early window states that have been proposed are among the original 13. Small rural states like Iowa must have a voice in our presidential nominating process. Democrats cannot forget about entire groups of voters in the heart of the Midwest without doing significant damage to the party for a generation. Iowa's Democratic caucuses have advanced diverse, historic, and often unlikely presidential candidates over the years, including Jimmy Carter, Barack Obama, and Pete Buttigieg. I have the deepest respect for the president and his principles. But the characterization of caucuses set forth in his letter did not reflect any acknowledgement of the historic changes we proposed to the Iowa caucuses. We recognize that the caucuses as they were no longer aligned with 21st century democracy and that we had no alternative but to reimagine the Iowa caucuses as a vote by mail state party run event. And still we received no consideration. Our process allowed flexibility as to the date while complying with Iowa law, 
and an additional state could have been added to the existing four as, as, an, adate, as an additional state could have been added to the addition, existing four. Instead, two very large, very expensive states are being added to the mix. This will surely favor front runners and billionaire vanity candidates. Make no mistake, Republicans and Iowa will seize this opportunity to double down on their caucuses and feed the narrative that Democrats have turned their back on Iowa. The actions taken here will be taken as a refusal to have a dialogue with voters and will exacerbate electoral difficulties in Iowa. We are creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of electoral failure and creating a Fox News bubble for our presidential candidates in which they have no opportunity or responsibility to meet and communicate in, with voters in red leaning states in the middle of this country. The historic candidacy of a black woman for governor of Iowa was all but ignored by national Democrats. How is this good for our party? And finally, I have no doubt this committee will adopt these proposals. And my no vote will be interpreted by some as a knee-jerk reaction to my state being deprived of a position in the nominating calendar. Be that as it may, as someone who has lived through a similar version of this process, I would be remiss if I did not say we are creating a situation of continued uncertainty that will continue to drag on throughout 2023. We can vote on this calendar, we can approve this calendar, but we will leave here with nothing settled. I say this not to attempt to bluster or imply a threat, to, but simply to acknowledge facts. In 2007, the matter of contest dates and order was not settled until less than a month before the first contest. There is limited amount of calendar real estate, conflicting state laws, and a GOP calendar that no longer bears any resemblance to ours. If passed as prologue, the states proposed here will spend the next year maneuvering for their preferred position and we have created an opportunity for other states to take a run at encroaching the pre-window. I simply ask everyone on this committee to consider the ongoing consequences and situations we will create as a result of the actions we take here today before you cast your vote. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott. I think our chair. Thank you, to Scott. Make a I just wanted to comment uh, on something that you just mentioned, which is uh, significant. In past cycles, the leadership of the Republican National Committee and their Rules Committee has been willing to uh, discuss and collaborate with us on uh, changes in the, in the calendar and the rules. Uh, we were rejected this time in any event, to in any attempt to have that conversation. Uh, that tells you something about the current status of the Republican National Committee and it leads to the divergence that you've just highlighted uh, in our processes. Uh, Mo? Thank you. I, oh. I just wanted, because I know there is a large external audience listening to this meeting and to what we have to say, I do think it is important that we as a party acknowledge and reaffirm that with this calendar, we are reaching out to people from all communities, including rural communities. Mm -hmm. I think it is important to recognize our chairman has run statewide in South Carolina. He could not ignore rural voters when he was running for office in South Carolina because there are a lot of rural voters in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, already I would assume, a lot of rural voters in Nevada. You cannot, Catherine Cortez Masto could not have won her reelection had she ignored rural voters. And so, and we could go on and on with all of the states that are on this proposal. I actually, while I hear everything Scott and appreciate everything Scott said, I do think it is important that we as a party hold up with pride a calendar that allows us to talk to all kinds of voters, racially diverse, geographically diverse, rural and urban and suburban, and that we not allow the Republicans to disparage what we are doing because I think this calendar makes us more competitive. We don't need to feel defensive about this calendar. 
when Republicans attack us, we can actually hold this up with pride and say, you try to play here. Mm -hmm. You try to play on this field. This is the field we want to play on. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud that we've put together a schedule that reflects that. Thank you, Mo. Uh, Maria? Thank you. I couldn't be prouder of not just this president. Excuse me, Maria, would you state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Maria Cardona uh, from Washington, D.C. I couldn't be prouder, not just of this president, not just of this party, but of this committee. And I mentioned this last night, but I want to say it publicly, because this was a difficult process. It was arduous, but it was also unequivocally, in my opinion, fair, transparent, and open. And while it might seem, and I want to really underscore this, that when we have seen this reported, that the proposal that we are looking at today and tomorrow was given to us by the White House. It was not given to us by the White House. The White House looked at everything that we had done, looked at every document that we took a look at, looked at every proposal, looked at all of the transcripts, looked at all of the comments, and they aligned with what this committee and this party had set out to do from the moment Chairman Harrison took the reins, which is for us to reflect in the nominating primary calendar, which is such an important piece of how our president gets elected, our nominee gets nominated, and then president gets elected, and to make sure that voices that had not been heard from before and that represent the current demographics of the country are represented. And I think we have been able to do that. And by definition, no one was going to be 100% happy. Uh, and, and I appreciate New Hampshire and Iowa for the service that they have given this party and this country for so many years. But it is time to change because the country has changed. The country does not look like it did 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we need to reflect that. And we need to give voice to the communities that have shown will support our candidates, will support our values as a party, and are the backbone of this country. And I also think it's important to remember that as a Latina, right, Artie, I would have loved for Nevada to go first, but I couldn't be prouder that Nevada is going to have a more important say in who our nominee is. And let's also not forget that South Carolina has a Latino population of 6.4% and growing, right? Let's not forget that. Georgia has a Latino population of 10% and growing. Michigan has a Latino population of 5% and growing. So I believe all of these states represent an incredibly important demographic, the, the Latino voters in this country that proved once again in this past election that they absolutely will support Democratic candidates because they speak to their values and that this ridiculous, mythical Republican wave among the Latino community was, frankly, mierda. And did, it did not come to fruition and will not come to fruition as long as we, with this calendar and with everything that we are focused on, will compete in all of these incredibly important communities. And I think this calendar does that. And I also want to make the point that it is important to, to, to note that, that we are not doing this to honor Joe Biden. President Biden is doing this to honor what the Democratic Party has underscored as our values historically. I remember when I first started in politics, my very first job was at the Democratic National Committee as a spokesperson for Latino media under Ron Brown. This was before Latinos were cool, right? 
That to me tells me that this party has historically understood where this country was going, where the growth was going, where the demographics were going, and Joe Biden and this White House are reflecting that now in uh, making sure to codify that in our primary calendar. And again, I could not be prouder of this party, of this committee, uh, of our chairman, of our co-chairs who have done just such incredible work, uh, and frankly, what we are doing to reflect the values of this country. Gracias. Thank you, Maria. So with that, I think we are going to move to lunch. So I'd like to entertain a motion to recess until 2 p.m. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> Is there a second? All in favor? Any opposed? We stand recess until 2 p.m. Thank you very much for the very robust and healthy discussion. Thank you, Maria.
Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. It is now, I'm not even going to say what time it is now, but the reporter knows. Uh, and I call this meeting of the Rules and Bylaws Committee back to order. Uh, as Minyan described to you this morning, we will now discuss the waiver process and propose a package of states to receive waivers of Rule 12A. Right before we get to that, though, I want to comment, and we will return to this uh, after we deal with the waivers, that we will be considering uh, and proposing uh, instructions for the next Rules and Bylaws Committee to uh, begin this very in-depth process again for 2028 uh, as soon as they are constituted uh, with a timeline and letters of intent and all of that that we did this time to get broad participation and full consideration that does not just say because it's always been done that way. <coughs> that was intended to make a ro record and I think it just did. Okay. Uh, to describe the waivers that we will propose, I'd like to turn to our counsel, Graham Wilson, to walk us through the drafted language. Thank you, Chair. So the waiver, the, as a reminder to the members of the committee, the way that our rule works is that all of the state parties uh, are required to hold uh, their primaries during our window, after the first Tuesday in March, on or after the first Tuesday in March, um, and before the second Tuesday in June. We adopted a rule in our delegate selection rules saying that this committee could approve waivers subject to the ratification of the full DNC to allow states to go before the window. The co-chairs uh, will have a motion before you shortly, which the text of which you have in front of you, um, to grant waivers to South Carolina, Nevada, New Hampshire, Georgia, and Michigan. The way that these waivers work is that they will specify a date certain that each one of those states needs to hold a state-run primary um, before the window. In order to ensure that the states are taking the necessary steps in order to match their process to the waivers that we have granted them, um, we are making these waivers on a contingent basis. You need to meet the requirements of the waiver in order for the waiver to be effective and, and in order to be able to hold your primary prior to the window. We want to make sure, given that all of these waivers are subject to ratification of the DNC, that the states are all taking the necessary steps to hold their primaries on the dates that we have approved them to hold their dates on prior to the DNC meeting that will happen in February. Accordingly, each one of these waivers uh, will specify a requirement for what the state party needs to do in order to assure this committee that they are taking the steps to hold their primary on the correct date before we reconvene and provide the waivers to the DNC for approval. Given the differences in state law for each one of these states uh, that you are considering giving waivers to, the requirement, the contingencies are different for each state. So for example, for South Carolina, the date of the primary is determined by the party chair. A court and in New Hampshire, it is set by state law. Nevada, it is set by state law. Georgia, it is established by the Secretary of State. And Michigan, it is uh, established by state law. So for each one of these states, we will require that by January 5th, 2023, that they provide certification or an information back to this committee showing that they are taking those steps. Between now and January 5th, each state needs to take the steps to, hold, to set its primary date um, on the date that we are granting them a waiver for. If they don't, 
If they don't take those steps, if they don't meet the requirements to give us the necessary certifications by January 5th, the waivers are automatically null and void, and, they ha and those states are thus required to go in the window with every other state. Chairman, happy to elaborate on any of the other details that you or any of the committee members have questions on. So, uh, the right thing here. When Uh, are there any questions uh, for Graham? Hearing none, Mignon and I move a resolution which will be displayed on the screen which grants waivers to Rule 12A conditional upon the outlined stipulations for a state-run primary in South Carolina on February 3, 2024. New Hampshire and Nevada on February 6, Georgia on February 13, and Michigan on February 27. Is there any further discussion? Mr. McDonald. Jim, it, it may be worth mentioning some of the conditions, and in particular, I think, um, emphasizing the President's emphasis on expanding access to voting uh, in some of these states is worth mentioning. Uh, yeah. Please, uh, Graham, would you? Absolutely. Thank you, David. So um, all of the states uh, that are being considered have um, robust, no excuse early voting in place, um, with the exception of New Hampshire, which does have absentee voting, but only with a certain limited excuses. So one, in addition to taking the steps necessary to show that the state is moving their date to the um, date we've identified by January 5th, um, in New Hampshire, um, you will see that there is an additional contingency um, in our waiver, which also requires the state to expand access to early voting um, in accordance with the you know, values that uh, this committee has um, discussed all cycle in terms of providing Apple ample opportunities for early voting and participation in our process. The other um, piece of the contingent waivers that you will see in um, all five of these waivers are that any of the early states are required to provide base voter file access to any presidential campaign at an amount no more than $10,000 to ensure that every campaign, uh, diverse campaigns, new, new candidates have an ability, just like um, more established campaigns, to um, get access to the party's voter file and fully participate in the system. Any further questions for Graham? Yes, uh, Ms. Fowler. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carol Fowler from South Carolina. I, I want to say first that I intend to vote for this proposal because my chair has asked me to. <laughs> and to say that South Carolina Democrats are honored to be in the first position. I do want to put on the record, though, that um, I, I'm not satisfied with the notion that it is helpful to our process to have three primaries in a three, day, three or four day period. Otherwise, I'm with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brennan. Scott Brennan, Iowa. Um, obviously, I've made my position known on the makeup of the calendar, um, but I would just suggest that uh, I, I think my good friend, Mrs. Fowler, has laid it out well. You're I think that this proposal impossibly truncates the process on the front end and really reduces the power of the three states that have been selected for those spots. And so I would be mindful of the fact as a committee that we, you know, the pre-window process was designed to produce strong presidential candidates who were able to compete in multiple places by jamming the three of these together in such a tight time frame, you've created a 
possibility of a, an impossible process. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Ms. Dadell. I would just add that by having these the first three states within a three or four day window also limits the candidate's ability. One of the things that New Hampshire is known for is our retail politics and candidates having the opportunity to engage the electorate face to face. Um, by having three states, one on top of the other, I think causes a, a little bit of conflict for candidates trying to uh, vie for the attention, uh, get name recognition, and also raise money. Um, those early, the early window is, you know, those that's the, the genesis of these campaigns, and many of the candidates uh, are not funded at that point. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, uh, Ms. Blanco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I want to thank um, you all uh, as our chairs of the committee for the work that has been put together, to the staff of the committee for the work that has been put together, and to all my colleagues on the committee for all the work that we have done on this. And I, Nevada, truly appreciates the accommodation that has been made. While not ideal to be on the same day as another state, we accept that and accept what the will of the president is, and that is what we are here to do um, for this committee at this moment. So I appreciate it, and Nevada is in support of these uh, recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Thank Blanco. You. Any further discussion? Yes. Luis de Arizona, I, I want to echo the support of doing uh, what this committee is about to do is set forth a calendar and with the hope and commitment of looking at 2028 uh, 20, uh, as an, another opportunity to evaluate what we can do for our country with the lineup of these states. Arizona would not have two Democratic senators, a Democratic governor, a Democratic secretary of state, a Democratic attorney general if it wasn't because of the impact of Nevada, Nevada organizers, Nevada learned how to teach the many states in the West, along with Colorado, how to transform these states from deep red states to actually having Democrats. And the same goes to South Carolina, the impact to Georgia. And these neighboring states have this contagious uh, opportunity, and I think this window really opens up the door of diversifying uh, not only the calendar, but the staff that gets hired, the folks that impact our Democratic Party to win major elections. And I do strongly support that we continue this reevaluation uh, in 2028 as a means to what else can we do for the country with this lineup. So we are finally putting, I think, the commitments of what is in our credo and in our bylaws, in, in, in our charter, to actually be. Uh, diversify not only the body of the DNC, but also how we elect the President of the United States. So uh, strongly supportive, but I really hope that the commitment about 2028 is uh, very much a part of this motion. That's why I wanted to get it on the record, and it's not a part of this motion, it's going to be a separate uh, resolution following this motion. Uh, uh, it is, let me just say that it is great, not just here, but in other places like Georgia, to see organizers acknowledged for what they've accomplished for the democratic pro process. Uh, and congratulations, Artie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, I think we're ready to move to, move to a vote on this motion. We'll start with the voice vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. 
Would those who said nay like to be recorded by name? Joanne Dowdell. Mr. Brennan, you are recorded as a nay vote. Any others? Joanne Dowdell, New Hampshire. Ms. Dowdell, you are recorded as a nay vote. Anybody else? I'm going to take everybody else who is present as a nay, as a yay vote, excuse yay. me, a yay vote. So the yays clearly have it, and congratulations to all of us. The resolution has been adopted, and I will turn back to you, uh, Mignon, for other committee business. Yes. Thank you all for all the hard work again. We will now move to consideration of the regulations of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. This, this. Ah, oh, before we do that. Yes, the chairman. Uh, we chairman. have a, a, you might call it a point of personal privilege, but it's actually yes. something that co-chairs are very anxious to hear uh, from Mr. McDonald. Um, I won't repeat my comments from this morning with respect to um, the need to continue looking at our calendar and the fact that um, we haven't solved a problem, we've simply started to look more seriously at changes that happen in the country. Uh, there's a limit to what this committee can do in terms of 2028 because um, we dissolve at the fall meeting of the, in 2025. Uh, but I would like to move that um, we, uh, I would like to move that preliminary applications for 2028 early state status must be received by the Rules and Bylaws Committee prior to the fall 2025 DNC meeting, which will enable this committee to gather interest in to find out if there are enough states who want to change things and give to the next committee um, uh, some indication of what the land what, of what the land is like, so that the next committee can do, can tweak the process that we set up this time to be appropriate to the um, number of states that are interested. But to tell the states now, be thinking about it. Don't don't be surprised when you get a notice that you have 30 days to to apply. You can be thinking about it now if you want to. So, so uh, Mr. McDonald, I'd like to suggest that you consider a friendly amendment to make that. Uh, before the first DNC meeting of 2020, uh, no, before the second DNC meeting of 2026, so that it goes directly to the new committee. So this committee will be on record about the process, but the actual receipt of, uh, uh, of uh, applications would, or, or preliminary notice would begin with the new committee. So the second, <clears throat> and unless my years are up, isn't the second, it, doesn't the new committee come in in the fall of 2025, not the fall of 2026? Yes. So it I mean, I will the first uh, the first DNC meeting of 2026. Yes. All right. So that they would actually be received by the full by the new be received okay. by the by the new committee. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, the new committee is elected at the first meeting in 2025. So, so we would hand the letters. So it over. actually could be by the second meeting of, of the uh, of the of the DNC in 2025. Mm -hmm. That's what the motion is: is the, the fall meeting in 2025. Strike like everything I just said. Well, it was I, I was going to say that the parliamentarian would advise me that a friendly amendment's not in order, but I was going to take well, it as I an amendment. That, I was no, I was going to take it as an amendment from a friend, and I was going right, to right. revise it, is, uh, we'll leave that, it the way if, it is. If that is how it currently reads, that does what I hope to. Yeah. Accomplish. Do you need after I all the bypass those applications to come to the new committee? I just know that there's always a risk that something that was first of all put in place by the old committee and then enacted by the old, uh, old committee gets forgotten, forgotten by the new committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, after all the byplay, do you need me to restate the motion? Couldn't hurt. Yeah. I move that um, preliminary applications for 2028 early state status must be received by the uh, Rules and Bylaws Committee prior to the fall 2025 yeah. DNC meeting. All right, uh, I'm actually going to interrupt again. <laughs> the chair who is elected at the first meeting of 2025, officers who are elected at the first meeting of 2025, the chair appoints his committee members at the second meeting of 2025. So I'm going to ask you to amend that to the first meeting of 2026, 
so that it goes to the newly appointed committee. Well, okay. That's where I was trying to go when I got, as we've done a few times, <laughs> here messed up on the dates. Yeah, all right. I will restate um, the motion. Okay. Uh, ask my seconder to withdraw her second, and I'll submit a new motion. Uh, move that the preliminary, ap the preliminary applications for 2028 early state status must be received by the Rules and Bylaws Committee prior to the first meeting of the DNC in 2026. That's correct. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. And that is unanimous among those present here. All right, thank you. And now I'll turn it over. Oop, yes, uh, Mr. Leone. Yeah, I was wondering um, if, if you could clarify uh, what the potential penalties are for states that don't uh, comply with the calendar rules that we've set out in our rules and that we've been discussing today. Are you, so you're talking about the rules in the waivers or? Um, I think I'm talking about just, just the general uh, penalties if states don't comply with our Yes, yeah, so calendar. there's a variety of them. I'm going to turn to Graham to uh, summarize some of them anyway. Happy to do so. So if you don't comply with the conditions of the waiver, you don't have a waiver, and you are not allowed to go before the window, right? So that's kind of step one. You don't follow the conditions, you then are obligated to go during the window with every state party. If then a state moves to go outside of the window because they don't have a waiver, um, our rules, the delegate selection rules, really clearly specify what happens. Excuse me. Um, un and this is rule uh, 21 of the delegate selection rules. First, um, any um, state that is going outside of the window automatically loses um, half their delegates. In addition, um, this committee strengthened those rules this cycle so that candidates are um, precluded from campaigning in any state that goes outside the window. And campaigning includes putting your name on the ballot in that state. Any candidate that violates that rule and puts their name on the ballot or campaigns in a state that is violating the windows um, receives um, no pledged delegates or delegate votes from that state. In addition, we also, um, I believe at our last meeting, could have been two meetings ago, um, um, made it clear in those rules that the national chair is also empowered to take any other appropriate steps to enforce these rules um, that aren't just, f for example, that could go beyond merely having the delegate stripped to other authorities within the purview of the DNC chair. So there are a number of um, delegate selection and other penalties um, which would immediately go into effect if a state were to not receive a waiver and then also go outside the window. So in the past, when these have been uh, considered, uh, sometimes in this, this category, there, one thing is placement on the floor, that's sometimes constrained by the size of the delegation. But something that is not constrained is there are hotels 40 miles away from the convention site. Mr. McDonald. I just want to um, add one additional comment. The penalties that Graham described are automatic and don't require a vote of the DNC. You lose half your delegates without us taking any action, but in practice we are highly likely to take away the rest of the delegates with an actual vote, depending on the state. That's what happened in 2008, because if a state is large enough, half of its delegates is still a big chunk of delegates. So um, for larger states, we might well take away the rest of the delegates. You can go beyond the automatic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're not, we've always had that option. There's. That's what happens without any vote at all, and then we have the option to take away the rest if we think it's, a, if we think it's appropriate. Nothing record is intended to restrict that, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, actually, it, Chair, the, the rules specify that um, the committee is um, not bound just by those um, penalties, but the committee clearly has the authority to take any other um, remedial steps um, as needed to um, enforce the calendar rules that it's adopted. 
Any further questions or discussion? Ms. Fowler. I think we talked about this in an, in an earlier meeting and I've just forgotten. If a candidate does not put his name on the ballot, but a state party or a secretary of state or somebody, add, and I think there are states where this is possible to do, uh, adds that candidate's name to the ballot, what, what happens then? So, that. Yep, the, it is Rule 21C1B, <laughs> which, um, which talks about the definition of campaigning, and it includes, and a candidate is not allowed to campaign in a state that is going outside the window, mm -hmm. and campaigning is defined to include placing your name on the ballot or failing to take action to remove it from the ballot. But it clearly also includes the um, standard definition of campaigning, actually giving speeches uh, uh, and doing anything in that state other than national fundraising appeals. That's absolutely right. It's in addition to having your name on the ballot, um, it's purchasing print, internet or electronic advertising. Uh, hiring campaign workers, opening an office, making public appearances, holding news conferences, all the normal things we associate with campaigning um, are prohibited for a candidate if a state is going outside the window. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing and seeing none, now I will turn it over to Co-Chair co Moore. Yeah. And I'm going to turn it back over to our chair who has a statement he wants to make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much, Mignon. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I want to thank all of you, the members of this uh, uh, very, very important committee of the D Democratic National Committee. I want to thank you all for all of your hard work. You know, we knew that it was a priority that this be reflective of the values of the Democratic Party which is embodied by our President of the United States, Joe Biden, and our Vice President, Kamala Harris. I continue, my friends, to be impressed by the level of commitment and the thoughtfulness we've seen throughout this process, including the respectful conversation we saw here today. When we started this process over a year ago, we knew how important it was to approach it with a clear framework and to have a thorough and transparent process. And I believe that we have delivered upon that. From the onset, I decided that I was going to let this process play out, that I wasn't going to be heavy-handed, and I was going to allow this committee to do what this committee does all so well, particularly Jim and Mignon, to allow you all to do your work without any involvement or very little involvement from the chair's office. My job as chair of this party is to fight for all of our state parties, all 57 state parties in our territories as well, which I've tried to consistently demonstrate, and I, and I hope each of our state parties and our state party chairs and vice chairs and all the DNC members know that I try that each and every day. And folks, I am so proud of all of our state parties and their presentations that they made before this committee. This has been an emotional process. And it's been emotional, particularly for friends that I've had since I've been involved with the DNC. But I just want to say thank you to all of you, because even despite the raw emotions, we have carried ourselves in the most dignified manner that I've ever seen. You know, I actually did not find out that President Biden was recommending South Carolina to be the first in the nation until last evening at the state dinner. I didn't have my phone. My, I just bought a new iPhone. And so my wife likes the camera on this iPhone. And so she had my phone all evening long. And when I was getting calls from staff, she was not answering them because she said I didn't need my phone uh, because we were at the state dinner. <laughs> and finally, General Malley Dillon, President, my, my friend and my colleague found me in the room. I was stuffing my mouth with a shrimp. And she said, have you heard? And I said, what are you talking about? She said, the president is recommending South Carolina to be first in the South. 
Folks, I was emotional. You all know how much I love my state. You all know how much I love this party and what this party has done for me. But you also know how much I love Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Folks, as a South Carolinian, I am, of course, the first black chair of that state party. I'm honored that my home state is a part of this process. Um, you know, earlier, I shed tears when we've seen folks that are not heard, folks that have not always been valued, folks who grow up and live on dirt roads, folks that don't have fancy college degrees, folks who live from paycheck to paycheck. People like my grandparents. You know, my grandma had an eighth grade education. She picked cotton and clean houses. My grandfather, a fourth grade ed Sorry for being so emotional, folks. You know, society call folks like my grandparents simple people and don't always value them, don't always cherish them, don't always give them their roses. But in my eyes, my grandparents are the wealthiest people I've ever known. Because they're rich in terms of their values. Hardworking people like Artie's parents. Good in America. These people have often been forgotten. Many times voiceless and voteless. And voteless particularly those in states like South Carolina. I don't know if you all know this. South Carolina is a state where 40% of enslaved people came through the port of Charleston. 40% of enslaved people. You can go anywhere in this, in this country, you talk to black folks, and I get This is a place where Briggs versus Elliott, and some of you may not know that. You know Brown versus Board, but the first case about desegregation was Briggs versus Elliott in Summerton, South Carolina. Thurgood Marshall came <laughs> to talk about that. States like Nevada, where Latinos have been building their political power and lifting their voices. Michigan, Georgia, where the phoenix of the New South has risen from the ashes of the Old South. A New South that is bold, that is inclusive, that is diverse. Reflecting all of our diverse and progressive values. And New Hampshire. Continuing the tradition, the great tradition here in America. That small government is good government. Small government by the people and for it. Biden will reflect the strength of America's greatest asset. And that is our diversity. This proposal reflects the best of our party as a whole. And it will continue to make our party and our country stronger. And it will elevate the voices who are the backbone of the party. This was a process and decision that we can all be proud of. The Democratic Party is the party of hope. This is the leadership that we have seen every minute of the Joe Biden presidency. He made a promise to this country when he ran for the presidency. And he has been working hard to keep that promise. First black woman ever on the Supreme Court most diverse cabinet in the history of this nation. And this proposal continues in that tradition, my friends. I'm grateful for the work of this committee, and I'm proud of the work that you have done. As always, I am proud to be a Democrat, but I am even prouder to be an American. Thank you all so much for what you have done today. Thank you for the continued work, and thank you for always fighting for the Democratic Party. Mr. Chairman, 
Mr. 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 Chair, thank you very much for those wonderful words. But thank you especially for sharing your emotion with us. Mm -hmm. Very, very important for us to realize the impact. I see the impact on others around this table as well. Uh, some of whose, almost all of whose families at one point uh, shared a great experience, but yours is the most moving that I've heard, and I really appreciate it. Well, I guess I have to follow that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm certainly emotional myself here, but I would just like to add, Mr. Chairman, I thought I heard you say that the president recommended that South Carolina be first in the South. The president recommended that South Carolina be the first primary in the nation. That's what he recommended. So I just want, just want to state that for the record. So now we'll move on to regulations and the rules and bylaws committee. This document supplements the delegate selection rules and the call for the convention. It also includes our rules of procedure, the procedures for submitting and considering state plans, and the process for challenges before the convention credentials committee is in place. The copy of the proposed regulations in your folders reflect changes recommended by the co-chairs and staff. As well, Jenna will be projecting on this screen so everyone can follow along. We will proceed by reviewing each regulation individually. We'll introduce each regulation and run through the proposed changes for 2022, for 2020 regulations. The floor will be open for RBC members to discuss. This is a deliberative process, and we encourage members to ask questions and give us thoughts on the proposed changes. I'm sure I didn't have to state that, but I thought it would be just good for you all to hear that. <laughs> After we've considered all of the regulations, we will vote on them as amended. Are there any questions on how we should proceed? With no further questions, let's proceed to the consideration of the regulations. The chair will now entertain a motion before discussion to adopt the regulations of the rules and bylaws as drafted and presented today. So moved. Is it? And we'll do discussion is after. It, yeah. Motion, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, there and, is there a motion? To proceed to consideration of the regulations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there a second? Thank you. <coughs> Actually, proceed to adoption of the regulations, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yes, thank that's, you. that's what we, yeah. <coughs> With a motion on the floor, we will begin our review of the regulations. So, Regulation 1 outlines the rules of procedure for this Rules and Bylaws Committee. In Regulation 1.4, we have proposed removing the phrase in person or by proxy to allow for virtual meetings and votes. We're updating Regulation 1.5 to provide for an RBC member to co-preside in the absence of one chair rather than only in the case of both chairs being absent. Regulation 1.6 is updated to provide for virtual meetings and for votes to occur over email or mail rather than in person, which will also be provided for by our change in Regulation 1.4. Any discussion of Regulation 1? If not, we'll move on to Regulation 2. Great. So Regulation 2 refers to the submission and review of delegate selection plans. The draft before you contains several proposed housekeeping changes. Regulation 2.1, oh, I'm sorry, could you hear me? Regulation 2.1 is a new addition. As we've done throughout the year, we've tried to proceed with caution as we've made some big changes. So as we embark with a newly determined early window and many new leaders in the state parties, we are requesting letters of intent from all state parties by March 1st. This will allow us to set up an early system to support 
the development of plans, as well as flag any issues for the committee preemptively. Regulation 2.2M is an addition to the regulations meant to reflect what we've heard from members regarding voter file access. Members spoke so frequently about the need to provide equitable and affordable access to candidates early on that we asked applicants whether they would be in support of providing the voter file in the state to, to candidates for a reasonable amount, in this case $10,000. Overwhelmingly, states agreed that this was a reasonable provision and made clear that their support was not just to encourage presidential candidates, but to strengthen the entire democratic infrastructure. So, we added this regulation to make clear that the terms outlined in the waiver you approved earlier today. Regulation 2.4 specifies the process should should the process should a state party require more time. Rather than require a chair to submit a formal letter, we've adjusted the regulation to allow the co-chairs or their designee to extend the deadlines, which will also allow us a measure of flexibility, flexibility as we navigate the challenges of the early window. Regulation 2.7a now includes the phrasing of, or four months before the respective states, first determining step, whichever is earlier, to align this regulation with the language of the previously passed rule. Regulation 2.7C has been edited to add, in reviewing submitted plans in noncompliance, the RBC may grant waivers, impose sanctions, or take corrective action contemplated in the Rule 21C. This does not add any, this does not add new courses of action, but confirms past practice of the ability of the committee to act under Rule 21C. Is there any discussion from the members? Do we see any hands? No. If there's no more discussion or no discussion, we will move to the consideration of Regulation 3. Regulation 3 deals with the general terms of challenges. We have drafted several changes to this section to simplify the challenge process. As you know, there are instances where a decision about a challenge needs to come to the entire RBC. The changes in this section are made to reflect this past practice, which is, not ev which is that not every challenge that comes before the RBC necessitates a, de a detailed fact-finding endeavor. Only a subset of instances requires a larger fact-finding hearing, and the purpose of these changes provides us the flexibility to address matters in this fashion. Regulation 3.4F addresses the review of challenges. We've updated it to include a section which states the co-chairs shall have the authority to adjust the timelines, deadlines, and technical procedures set forth herein as most appropriate and required by the circumstances of an individual challenge to account for any specific remedial measures needed to address a challenge. Regulation 3.4.G.3 Sounds like an IP address, okay. <laughs> Clarifies that a challenge may be dismissed if it is not a valid challenge under the requirements provided for within the regulations, slow, solely as a housekeeping change. Regulation 3.4.I has been updated to allow for the co-chairs to determine if a factual hearing is necessary and also allows the co-chairs rather than just a designated hearing officer, to call for a pre-hearing conference in the hopes of streamlining the challenge process. Regulation 3.4.J has been updated according to the change in 3.4.I to specify that a hearing may or may not be deemed necessary and specifies that a hearing does not need to occur, if a hearing does not need to occur, 
It will be done so under the guidelines, excuse me, that if a hearing does need to occur, it will be done so under the guidelines provided for in Section J. Regulation 3.4.K has been updated to allow for virtual meetings. Regulation 3.4.L simplifies the request for consideration <clears throat> by the full committee for filing a petition for review and clarifies a path to full consideration of the RBC if there is not a hearing. We have removed the provision in 3.4.M.3 three small eyes, <laughs> which, which requires a significant number of briefs for the RBC. I will now open the floor to any discussion from the members. Hearing none, I will uh, move back to Co-Chair Moore for uh, discussion of Regulation 4. Thank you, Jim. Regulation addresses the implementation of the 2024 delegate selection rules as passed by the full DNC in September. We added regulation four point, well, four period, four period B, in recognition of the fact that some states have ballot fees ascribed to those running for delegate on the ballot. An example, a two-party primary. This is a rule, this is because rule 2.2 D prevents fees related to participating in the delegate selection process, and while Rule 15.D and past versions of the rules limited the amount a delegate or an alternate could be assessed to be on the ballot, we removed 15.D. This cycle, as the majority of it was, this cycle, as the majority of it was redundant and related to candidate fees. After removing it, there was not a rule related to delegate fees for being on the ballot, and Regulation 4.4 makes it so fees from state government do not invalidate a state party's delegation selection plan. We made changes in 4.9.A and B to use more appropriate gendered language consistent with our other rules. In Regulation 4.14, we removed the provision that a voting member of the DNC must be registered to vote with their respective state. David McDonald had, a suge had suggested this would preclude those with felony records or other factors, and, and the purpose of this regulation is achieved by the provision that one must legally reside within their respective state. Under Regulation 4.17, we removed the reference to Rule 10.8.3 as we removed it from the rules in this cycle and updated 4.17.A to reflect the language in Rule 10.A. The floor is now open for discussion. Yes, David. We um, have a regulation 4.29 that um, I, I'm not sure is really necessary. It, it says, in states using a caucus system for their delegate selection process, presidential preference must be determined at the first step in the process, and it's uh, citing to Rule 14b, but we've actually already said in, in the actual rules themselves in 2K5 um, that uh, in states that uh, use party processes, uh, they have to require that the allocation of all delegates, national delegates, be locked in at the final expression of preference at the first determining step as determined by the state's plan subject to recount. I actually find the language of the rule clearer than I find the regulation, and I'm wondering if we can just delete 4.29 mm -hmm. um, rather than have the wording in there. Uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, so let's amend this recommendation to remove Regulation 4.29 relating to Rule 14b. And then I, I, I don't want to propose language or anything, but it seems to me we have 
what's a pretty clear statement in Rule 2K5, but it might be read to only apply to party-run processes, but we're going to be dealing with states potentially that have other forms of multiple expressions of preference in government primaries. And am I correct that we would apply the same standard to those? That this rule basically is going to apply to everything, even yes, no matter where it's yes, located. Yes, you are. That's yeah. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So there's a motion on the floor to delete. Okay. Yes. Uh, motion so to delete 4.2. It's a motion in the which in the form of an amendment mm -hmm. to delete this provision. Uh, Mr. Leone, did you want to comment? Yeah, I was just wondering why it was in there in the first place. Presumably it serves some sort of purpose. I don't know if we changed the rule so it no longer serves a purpose or if we're trying to um, achieve some other goal. I'm not sure. Well, there's other language that accomplishes this purpose. Yeah. I'm not sure whether that other language existed at the time this regulation was, uh, uh, was put in here or not. I think the 2K5 language came in after the Unity Reform Commission when we did a whole bunch of reforms of the caucus process and we put that language in, Frank. I, th I think the reg predated the language that I read, that's all. Artie, you're indicating that's your recollection as well? Yes, it was uh, Artie Blanco, Nevada. Um, it was in regards to our three-tier three process, three-step process in a sense, in a caucus state previously um, Nevada had allowed that there was one or a couple positions that could be set at a county at the second step, and that was a result of 2016, so it was changed for 2020. So this language was to, af as a, after a recommendation of the Unity Commission, mm -hmm. to adjust that particular. And so therefore you would say this is no longer necessary? It's no longer, not for Nevada, it's no longer necessary, no sir. <laughs> Frank, are you satisfied with that? No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> because I think David's trying to pull a fast one. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that expression of... Uh, I am shocked. <laughs> shocked that, that you would think that. That personal attack will be deleted from the record. <laughs> Oops. Thank you, sorry. The, the, I mean, David, is your thought that taking this out would facilitate ranked choice voting? Oh. No, my thought is that taking this out would do nothing because it's already covered by a language in the rule and the regulation can't override the rule. Deleting this has no, has no effect on ranked choice voting. So. Okay, now I'm satisfied. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Boylan, as, as usual, has just clarified that for me by showing, where the, showing me where the language was moved to. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, so we need to vote on that motion to amend. Any further discussion? All those in favor say. Back to you, Jim. Discussion yeah, thanks. The uh, we will move to Regulation 5, mm -hmm. which ad addresses the call for the 2024 Democratic National Convention, which was adopted by the DNC in September. For Regulation 5.1, which defines regions for the purpose of bonus delegates, we removed the explanatory prefaces to simplify each section. In Regulation 5.3.A, we clarified that the election reference is the general election. Hearing none, back to you, Mignon. Okay. So we're going to Appendix A. Appendix A addresses the methods a state party can use to allocate district-level delegates among the state's districts as provided in Rule 8.A. There are no proposed changes to this appendix. Is there any discussion from RBC members? To allocate district level delegates by proportional representation as required by Rule 14. You'll see that we only have a couple of minor corrections in the first paragraph and step five, plus a gender reference update in step six. Are there any questions or discussion? Hearing none, we, will, we now have now completed our review of the regulations. We started our discussion. We've specified the pages should be as evenly divided by gender as possible. 
And that is potentially problematic language that might suggest something along the lines of one third, one third, one third. I think what we meant was should be as equally divided as possible. Because we have elsewhere defined what equal division is um, as being a difference between men and women no more than one. The concept of gender begins to get a little bit more mm -hmm. expansive. So but these pages shall be uh, as equally divided as possible. Yes. So you, you're basically proposing to amend out the word evenly and in the word equally. Right. And not insert the words by gender. <coughs> and remove the words by gender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, what yeah, does I'm not sure we have a term yet maybe. in English for by gender or non gender. Uh, so take care of. Uh, is if there are other ways to evenly divide things. So, I mean, or race, ethnicity, what? I, I think we have to specify what we are evenly, how we are evenly vi dividing. Maybe you're right. As I was searching for a word, maybe we need to go with a few words and say by... That was the reason why I wanted to change the term evenly divided to be equally divided, because equally divided is defined in both the charter and in our, our rules as applying to the allocation of delegates between men and women. When you say evenly divided, it raises the questions that you just raised, but when we substitute equally divided, we can refer back to our definitions. It's a defined term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. The motion is to strike evenly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And the ayes have it. So we have now completed our review of the regulations. We started our discussion with a motion to approve the regulation of the regulations of the Rules and Bylaws Committee as amended today. Yes, sir. We will direct staff to make any typographical or similar edit edits that are discovered. Is there any further discussion before we move to a vote? Hearing none, we'll move to that vote. All those in favor of the motion Please say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. And the ayes have it. I just had a question. So when we adopt the regulations, that's the end of the regulations are adopted. They don't need to be further adopted by the DNC. Is that right? The regulations are adopted by this committee. Right, the clarify. rules that the regulations uh, implement uh, are adopted by the full DNC. Have been, yes. Yeah. You're going to get uh, a handout from the staff. It's the model plan. So next on our agenda is consideration of the model plan. As you, know, as you may know, the RBC prepares a model plan that states may use when preparing their delegate selection plans. We provide this model plan to states because we recognize that we require a lot of information from the state parties about their process as a part of our assessment of their delegate se selection process. This model, but it is not required. Using the model helps make sure everything is included in the state plan. The model plan you have is a draft. Staff will update the model to reflect the changes to the regulations adopted today. We don't normally take a vote to adopt the model plan. It's treated as an administrative function. However, if you have any suggestions about the model plan or see something that could be improved or may not be of the model plan in your folder, but it looks like it's being handed out, and Jenna will project the plan on the screen as we go through the document. Many of you are familiar with the general layouts we use in this model plan. This document attempts to include the various options available to state parties for their various steps in the process. 
and in many cases, we're asking the state party to provide us with a description or details about how their process complies with the top line, but please feel free to let us know if you have any questions as we go through the plan. The model plan is set up with some macros in the first couple of pages that makes it easy for certain basic information about the state and the, and the process to be populated through the plan. Jim, we'll go to section one. So section one of the model plan <coughs> provides an overview and determining step. We have a section on voter participation that provides information about party registration and participation in the process. That is essentially how the state complies with rule two. Section two describes what presidential candidates must do to participate in the state's process. Section three deals with the selection of delegates and alternates. It walks us through the state's process review process the proportional allocation of delegates to candidates based on the state's election results, and the steps necessary to ensure equal division of the delegates and alternates if the state is also electing alternates at the district level. This section also includes a description of the automatic delegates and confirms that these delegates are counted as part of the total number of delegates, official delegate positions, the so-called PLEOs, the presidential candidate review process, and how these delegate positions are apportioned to the candidates based on the statewide results and how the PLEOs are selected. This section further sets out the process for selecting the at-large delegates and alternates. It covers how the at-large delegates and alternate candidates file, the presidential candidate review process category will be used if necessary to help the state achieve the demographic goals included in the state's <coughs> affirmative action and outreach and inclusion plan. And finally, this section provides information about how delegates and alternates are replaced on a temporary or permanent basis and how, they, and how permanent replacements are certified to the secretary so that we have an accurate record of who is qualified to vote at the national their selection of delegates late in the process will describe how they will select temporary standing committee members to ensure they have representation if committees meet before the state selects the regular members. All states will provide information as to when their delegates will meet to select the standing committee members, how these members are apportioned to the presidential candidates, and the list of the deadline by which the candidates must provide their list. Committee by preference and overall. Section five delineates, delineates where the delegation will select the delegation chair, when the delegation will select the delegation chair, and when the state chair will name the convention pages. Minya? Thank you, Jim. Section six provides us with details about the, the state's presidential electors how they are selected and certified, and how the state party will ensure that the procedural guidelines. Here's where we incorporate the six basic elements, our rules prohibiting discrimination, the good conscience rule, prohib prohib pro prohibiting of the unit rule, quorum requirements, proxy requirements, slate restrictions. Section eight is the affirmative action plan and outreach and inclusion plan. We encourage state parties to be creative, their state specific diverse communities and coalitions to get them involved and active in this process and the party's operation. This section specifies the goals set by the state party for inclusion of our democratic constituents based on the state's democratic electorate. The DNC will also work with each state party to ascertain Democrat, demo, demographic composition of the state's democratic electorate. In this is to inform them about this process. As well, this section describes the important role of the presidential campaigns play in helping maximize participation of our democratic constituents 
and how the campaigns will work with the state party toward meeting the representation goals. Section 9 outlines the process for filing challenges related to the test and includes a timetable that reflects when and what occurs in each step of the state's process. And finally, there is a section describing each of the documents the state party will need to, to provide to the Rules and Bylaws Committee as a part of our review process. With that overview, the floor is now open for any discussion or questions from members about the model plan. Six presidential electors, it looked like it had a site to the call section eight, which describes that, but it seems to be uh, taken out. I was wondering why, why that site was removed. It seems like you would want to keep that in. Okay. I think the staff can make that update, Frank. Did they get it? Would you repeat <coughs> repeat what you're saying? Sure. Right. It's uh, Section 6, Presidential Electors. Mm -hmm. And it originally... So Section... Yeah. Okay. I, I think as we suggested before, mm -hmm. if anybody notices any other inconsistencies, Please let the staff know as soon as possible. You just want to be mindful that sites can be hard to find. Right? That's why we ask staff to take a good hard look at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what Veronica said is want to be mindful sites can be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to reflect for a moment on section one, subsection C, two, and three. <clears throat> I just want to talk on behalf of all of the state party chairs present and most of them not present in this room today to say that while I understand the intention of these additional uh, requirements, I want control in the, their state. They don't have the ability to effectuate change in any way, shape, or form. Or consider even highly democratic states where the state party really has no relationship with their elected officials. This is a very, very heavy and time-consuming burden. It's not to say that state parties shouldn't be actively involved in all these measures, uh, but I fail to see what it has to do with act actually putting forth that helps protect voters' rights and helps uh, ensure that we are living our values, of course. But by t I'm, I'm still unsure why we're tying it to the National Delegate Selection Plan, what it has to do with the actual election of delegates to our national convention. Most importantly, each year that I've been on this committee, there are members on this committee who continue to put additional burdens on state parties, many of them that do not have the staff to even comply with this. And so they spend their time, their energy. I just want to again remark that this is a very heavy burden for our state parties to carry. Jenna, would you scroll to uh, C2 and 3, just so we can see what Ken is referring to? The voters are not registered and rolled. Oh, it's 1, 2, and 3? It's, like it's up a little uh, the, oh. the other way. OK. okay. So we have the deadline to register to vote, mm -hmm. an overview of the state's voter registration and enrollment procedures. Yeah. Yeah will be allowed to participate in the delegate selection process. At no, state of, uh, at no stage of the state's delegate selection process shall any person be required to pay a cost or fee. No person shall participate in the nominating process who also will not have any other party. So I think this is applying, this is applying to actions in the Party run delegate selection. Uh, letter right C. One. Mm -hmm. Okay. Section one, uh, letter C. Taking steps. Numeral two. Okay. Or to seek Where it amendments. says, describe how the state party has taken steps or is taking steps to seek enactment of legislation, rules, and policies. That whole section, followed by section three there, I see. Okay. are related to was... legislation and related to um, uh, ordinances and other things that state parties, I mean, look, I wish we had the type of power that some on this committee think we do to actually effect, uh, effectuate legislative change. And you have us spending 
ch sort of chasing the tail on this stuff. Look, we do this in our state. A vet probably does it in her state. I'm sure Susan does it in her state, but there's a lot of state parties that can't. They don't have the staff to spend that time on this. So it's I a think, heavy burden. I think what we're asking state parties to do here is to be aware of these goals and to specify what they are able to do to, uh, to meet them. To say that we, you know, have made, made this our policy, but we love the situation. Uh, and puts and puts them on re on record. I think that's as what this goes to. Uh, and Frank, can't, uh, before Frank goes, and I tell you, I'm I'm sitting here reading this thing. I have to pull these glasses down. But to so voter and election security and combat election subversion. I mean, if if nothing else, the state party should be able to flag it to show that they have trouble in their states, even if they can't. It, they can't pull it all together. Just understanding what's happening in your state, so I just want to point that out. And frankly, yes, I, I, I agree with the with the chair's statements. I would point out that the delegate selection rules were already adopted, so this 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 model um, uh, plan is only reflecting the rules that we've already adopted. So we've already done that, and for the reasons that the chair stated, and. What does, what does it have to do with our delegate selection process? Well, we just passed a resolution on the waivers that conditioned the new democracy as a fundamental part of our, of our delegate selection effort. So that's why it's there. I, I continue to respectfully disagree that it poses some sort of impossible version on state parties, a uh, burden on state parties. And certainly the DNC Voter Protection Department has made it clear that they are happy to work with states and, and, uh, and help them to try to fulfill these goals. So I think this is a, a guide to what can be recounted in narrative mm -hmm. and what we would hope, by this being in the model plan, I don't think creates any disqualification. Right. And I say that for the record. Mm -hmm. Susan? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I could just add in, and I appreciate um, the co-chair's comments on this and Frank's work on this, but what I would ask to, just to put it out there, is to be mindful of, you know, Yvette and Ken and I have been around a while, but we have a lot of new chairs and new executive directors coming in in January. So as someone who has sat on this committee and watched some state parties be beat up before on this, you know, proof positive steps and whatever, and what have you done? I think, to me, it would just help if we all, like, you know, generally agree that in the spirit of what um, Co-Chair Moore uh, Mignon said, that, you know, we're not here to be punitive. We are here, we understand your situation and that, of course, we should be working to expand. To always be very mindful of, and Carol always is. Uh, when she talks about state chairs uh, and, and what we have to do. Um, I know you didn't intend it this way, because you know, I know you and I have a great relationship, Frank, but don't presume to say what state parties can and can't do if you have not been a state party chair, right? Mm -hmm. So don't presume to say what is a burden on a state party chair if you've not been a state party chair. And I know you didn't intend it that way, so that's, mm -hmm. but, I, but that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And when we have uh, income, they were new. They were new. Right now, I'm facing central committees and Democrats in Maryland who for eight years have had a Republican governor. We've got to have a whole attitude shift now because just like we have Joe Biden as the head of, this, of the uh, party now, I have Wes Moore as the head of the Democratic Party. I've worked as chair under a governor, but a lot of these people never have before. We've got serious learning curves that take place constantly because there's constant something that, that you feel is burdensome in some way, but just don't automatically assume that it's not burdensome to state party chairs when we have, we have, we have a heavy lift and we're dealing with so many personalities and I'm mm -hmm. always so grateful, which is why I'm glad to be sitting by Carol because she speaks up for state parties all the time because mm -hmm. you know what we're dealing with. So let me publicly thank you, but I just wanted to kind of put that on record. So I'd like to point out both factually and for the record that the model plan is attend, intended to be an assistance qualifier, and it's not a mandatory, uh, a mandatory format. Uh, Ms. Daughtry, did you have something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chairman, you clarified for me. I just wanted to make sure I was clearly understanding that we've already passed 
the requirements. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, a, a means or a model by which the state parties may fulfill the requirements that we've already Yes, Luis. Mr. Chair, uh, Luis Heredia from Arizona. I, and as a former executive director of a state party, I, I, I completely understand. And having written the plan, having to collect data, and having to do the work to uh, fulfill the DNC, uh, I, I do want to do better. I, and this is not, uh, I've said this before to this body, is that we achieve a lot of goals in our delegate and our convention itself, and party chairs to use the opportunity in the affirmative action plan to also share the election of state party chairs, of vice chairs, how the, the DNC members to the permanent national committee get elected as a vehicle for education. Mm -hmm. It is, you're, you're talking to individuals that are new to the Democratic Party. Every four years, uh, folks get very excited about being a, de a delegate to the national convention. Mm -hmm. It is a great opportunity for them to look at opportunities, I think, should be very proud of our convention because there is a representation and it looks like America when you're in that room. But sometimes when I walk into the Arizona Democratic Party in our state, in our state party, it does not even feel like Arizona. In my, in my opinion, I've worked really hard to try to encourage more participation, but it's about education and it's about involvement. It's about encouraging. I'm talking about folks that are new to being a part of a Democratic Party to a political institution and it takes heavy lifting. So use the vehicle of the convention to educate folks to how to also participate in all party affairs. I will not add any conditions or any things to the plan, but it is extremely important because when I walk into the permanent DNC, we, do not we are not reflective of what we see at the convention level. Uh, and I, want, I, I, I aspire to be that the, the DNC membership, the, the, chair, uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party does uh, a great equalizer in, in their nominations to the collective body. And so I just want to challenge our party to do better. I, I think that's a, a very useful point. Uh, the chair's appointments are explicitly intended for that purpose. And someday, let's hope we don't need them. Yes. And, and I just want to piggyback on something that the bishop said. Yes, this, is, you know, these, this has been approved and everything, but I still want us to be mindful of what state parties can do, and uh, some state parties may not be. That's all I think that Ken was saying and that uh, Susan was saying that I'm saying. So if that means that it's uh, you know, extra tutorial that we have to do with ASDC, you know, it might come to that. Um, you know, as we have our meetings uh, and working with chairs, especially new state party chairs. But um, we would, I would just ask for a little bit of uh, grace as we work through this in bringing other state party <laughs> chairs up to speed with, you know, where we may already be. That's it. Actually, I, I just want to actually open it up pathways for leadership within our party. How are we bringing new voices in? Uh, that's what this should be used for. But um, uh, to compel state parties to, many state parties aren't involved in the legislature. They're not involved in passing ordinances or laws. They're, they're strictly involved in, in the process of running their party. And it's not to say they shouldn't be, Frank. Uh, they should be, but not every state party is equipped to do that. I think what Luis is talking about is the type of conversation we should be, powerful rooms reflect who we are as a party. That is a, a, a deeper conversation that frankly does have something to do with legislation around voting rights, but not altogether. And I would say where we focus so much on voter protection and voting rights are things that are completely out of, the, uh, out of our hands in this room. None of us, well, some of us around here may be elected. I know there's a few folks who are elected to the legislature. You know, the senator here has more power than I do, and I've been a chair for 12 years. Hardy and the people involved reflect the values, and how are we actively recruiting and creating new pathways to leadership and involvement? That is exactly the conversation we need to have, Luis, and I'm happy to have that, and we've talked about that. Uh, but I will just go on the record again. Every single one of these under Section 2 and Section 3, while I understand the intent of it, are additional work that someone in the state party has to do. And where does this information go? Does it just sit on a shelf? What's done with the information? I mean, on, what is done with this information when someone on my staff has to go out and collect all this information and do it? That's the challenge here. 
it's, there's a real life consequence and a cost to me in a state party to have to go and pursue this, 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 this chase of information. And again, Frank, I understand this. I just want to go on the record once again. These are burdens to state parties that cost us money and time. Frank? 51 state parties around the country to improve voting and help elect Democrats. That's, that's where it goes. And, um, I, I, you know, what this, this is more intended as a checklist for people who aren't familiar with the process. These are some of the things that people should be familiar with, be aware of. And, and to say a state party doesn't pay any attention to voting laws just strikes me as weird. I mean, I, 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 think, I think how people vote uh, is more important to be aware of those issues. And that's all this does, and that's all it's done. And it's not punishing anybody for not doing anything. There is no history of any state party being punished in any way under these sections. It's, it, just, it just brings to uh, for the four important issues on voting rights, defending democracy, and there's a wonderful, wonderful DNC department that is pros and cons to this, but I do want to share a quick story, a positive story about the effectiveness of a state party. This summer, and it interrelates to this, but it doesn't relate, but it does relate. Okay, so let me just get to the story. This summer, we were um, engaging with Karen Bass, and Leah, Donna, and I had her on several conference calls. We discovered early on that the mail-in process for for California, in particular Los Angeles, was very, very new. We reached out to her up with Karen's staff so that they could be trained and equipped to deal with the irregularities around mail-in votes. And so on one level, the party is really functioning very well. And to strengthen that and to suggest, as Yvette has said, that they continue to look at these guidelines, I think it's only healthy for the party. We get that it's a cumbersome process, but the result of a state party being very effective. Yana, I, I just wanted to echo what you said, but also, Ken, I, I recognize that we might be placing more burdens on state parties and requesting this information, but also making sure that states are aware of some of the changes that are constantly uh, going on in the, in, the, in, the, in the voter protection space. And most recently, and I want to say to Chair Warnock led it, Reverend Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock led it, but I, we backed it and supported, ensuring that we had early voting right after Thanksgiving. It matters that state parties are engaged, mm -hmm. that uh, Congresswoman Nakima Williams, the chair of the party, engage, it matters. So I just want to thank the party for, and trust me, as, as party, former party chair, I mean, you know, when I used to look at the legal bills, close years, which now I should have been the lawyer, damn it. Uh, but when I looked at the results, whether it was in states like Arizona, whether it was in several of the southern states that we know we've had some problems since uh, the um, Supreme Court decision and um, Holder v. Shelby, Shelby v. v. Holder. I'm so glad that we do have a party that cares about uh, voting rights and voter protection, but more important, station has been eliminated or if it's been moved, it has been in large part because of our state parties that we have been notified of some of these changes. So I want to applaud the state parties for what you do. I know we put a lot of burden on you, I remember when I was chair, again, there was this little budget item. You know, I used to go over the budget all the time. And there was a budget item of how much money we provided to state parties. And by the time I left, Jamie, I know it went up. <laughs> a lot. A lot to what we're allocating, the budget and the resources, we're also providing state parties with resources. And if in the future we got to do more, we got to do more. Mm -hmm. Ken, we got to do more. The right to vote is precious. The right of every citizen to participate in the election process is important. That is what we the people is all about. So I recognize the burden, but I support uh, the efforts to ensure that our state parties are at the table helping us shape the future of our I want to clarify this because you and I are on the same page. Luis and I are on the same page. 
The reality is, is there's an assumption that state parties, there's some assumption here that state parties based on my statement don't care about voter protection. That's absolutely incorrect. I ran one of the largest voter protection programs of any state party. Spent millions of dollars. Most of our state parties do, a vet does. Most state parties are engaged in that. That's separate from this national delegate selection plan. My, my, my problem is, is that there's an assumption just in this document alone that most state parties aren't heavily engaged with those that are, are out there actually on the front lines protecting the rights to vote every day. We are. And, and almost every state party is engaged in that work. My only point on this is it seems to be a miss. I'm not sure why it's in this document. And all this does is add more burden to, again, we can, we're on the front lines with the investment that Jamie and, and others have made in the state parties, we're on the front lines protecting the right to vote. And I will tell you, I wish the DNC could do more. The vet who is the chair of our voter protection at the state parties, or me as the president of the association, are saying we shouldn't be involved in voter protection work. Guess what? Mm -hmm. State parties are the ones that have to be because of the unique situation in each of our states. Guess what? I'm the only one that can put poll challengers into precincts throughout my state. State parties are the ones that have to be involved in this. So they're, to suggest that they're not is not correct. What I am suggesting here is having a document which basically puts more burden on them and has nothing to do with the election of, I'm happy to get Raina and any, any of one else at the DNC the information they need. We work with her every single day. She knows what we're doing and, and we're not doing in the way of our voter protection programs. Let's fix the problem that we need to fix if there's a problem, if state parties aren't doing their part. But I want to be very clear. This is just a burden that is not necessary. It is a solution in search of a problem. Let's dig into the real work of actually protecting the vote instead of just checking a list and saying, well, we're asking state parties what they do in this document, parties who find this process exceedingly difficult. Guess what? Instead of doing the work of, that Luis is talking about, all next year, what are our state parties, especially the small ones doing? They're spending a lot of their time, energy, and money on this document, trying to get it right trying to do all the proof positive steps that are required in here, and it costs a lot of time and money, especially for those small state parties. That's all I'm trying to suggest, and, Donna. And Ken, not, yep. to, not, not to argue back, yes, but those please. state parties is also key to our understanding of how the process is, is being developed in the state. So uh, bear with us, and if it doesn't look like it's going to uh, get off the shelf, I'll be the first to, to help you remove it from the menu next time. Well, if I'm around, you know, I gotta gotta keep uh, begging somebody to appoint me, you know. Well, Ken, thank you for bringing you, it up. Ken. Those very valuable points, Frank. Thank you for entering this into the discussion. I think I'll now turn it back over to my co-chair. For parties can use as they draft their plan. This is the same document the party affairs staff will use when they review each state's delegate selection plan. You have a copy of the draft checklist in your materials. Staff will be finalizing the checklist and will include it in the documents that are provided to the state parties later this month. Once again, if you see any inconsistencies or potential improvements uh, uh, or typos, please let staff know as soon as possible. Any questions about the checklist? Over to our chair who has some words he'd like to discuss. Yeah, I one of the things I, I wanted to make sure, in particular, uh, I emphasize in, in this process, uh, because there has been a change. Uh, for a long time, as long as I've been aware of politics, uh, Iowa was a, a crucial part in terms of how we did the selection process. Iowa, for the first time just recently, uh, elected their first African... Uh, of the past few years. Iowa just recently, Scott mentioned this earlier, and, and of course we know when I first became a state party chair, uh, Scott Brennan was also the state party chair in Iowa, and we became good friends. And I know Carol has worked long uh, with, with, with Scott when she was uh, the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. Uh, Scott has given so much to this party, and we are so grateful and thankful for him as well. So thank you, Scott. Uh, and I, I want the folks that in Iowa all we had, uh, it is because things have just changed. You have some of the best representatives to the DNC that I've ever met in any state. Ross and Scott poured their hearts uh, into the effort to make sure that they made the best case for Iowa in this process. And I want folks in Iowa also to understand that 
this does not diminish your value as a state in what you bring on a level, on the state and legislative level. That commitment is unwavering. And so I just, I just want to make sure that that is on record, that folks understand that this process, and we are all committed that in four years, we're going to revisit this whole thing all over again. And so Iowa and every other state that didn't get it this time will get an opportunity to, to tee it up one more time and put out the best path forward. So I just want the folks in Iowa to also just understand you got some amazing people all over that great state. So Scott, Ross, thank you again for all you do and all your DNC members from Iowa as well. So thank you again. So members, we've come to the end of our journey. I do have some good news. We don't have a meeting tomorrow. So thank you so much for all the hard work and the diligence. We are still having dinner. It's at 630. But before we leave, are there any questions that you have? We want to make sure you get it all. Will we start reviewing plans? I'll leave that to the staff. Summer, summer, are we looking spring or summer? Yep. Yeah, so our, oh, um, yep, so our application deadline, or our delegate selection plan deadline is May 3rd. I'm sure we'll get some uh, plans along the way, but our intention is to conduct a training at the upcoming ASDC meeting to help state parties learn to put these plans right. together, walk through the model plan with them, and some of the things we discussed today. Um, at the end of the month, we'll be sending out the materials to them, additional materials that they would like to. Um, we'll begin the process of receiving their materials in the spring, beginning with that letter of intent, March 1st. Um, they'll publicize their plans by April 3rd, and then by May 3rd is the deadline to submit them to us, and so after that point, okay. unless we have them. So it'll be okay. next summer will be the very mm -hmm. intense yeah. work period for us. Yes. Okay. Like this mm -hmm. summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if we have no further questions, I want to, oops. Um, this cycle, which was very useful to actually schedule the meetings well in advance because we know when the plans are coming in and then we can all make plans around that. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Any more questions? Well, I want to thank you again and I want to make sure that my co-chair here is if he wants to have a final word before we adjourn. Well, I certainly want to thank all of you. I want to thank uh, the wonderful staff of this great hotel. And the Secretary's office. And Mr. Chair, thank you for joining us in this process and for your important contributions to our understanding of where we are and where we're going. So, and I think we should also thank the President of the United States Yes. Uh, for being courageous and clear. Yes. Okay. So, without objection, we will adjourn. Thank you very much. Yes. Six thirty. Huh? Yes.